these canyons for six million years. I have traveled from the Rocky Mountains to the deserts through scorching heat and freezing cold from the land of the dinosaurs to fields of food. I lend my hand to seven states, two countries, nine national parks, and 36 million people across an arid west. I am not the strongest or the largest, but I am the hardest working. People love me. My playfulness. My beauty. My power. My life. But I don't think I can offer any more. I am tired. I am tired. Of the hundreds of major rivers in the world, I am one of the few who no longer kisses the sea. Battles to harness my soul have been won and lost. Use me wisely and I will sustain you. Use me like you have and I will break. My name, My name is, is Red. Red, the Grand River Red, the American Nile, the Canyon Maker, I am the Colorado River, and I am the most endangered river in America. Two anti-government, self-described revolutionaries have shot up a pizza restaurant as well as a Walmart in Las Vegas. The internationally syndicated political series, The David Pacman Show, provides progressive talk, analysis, and interviews with the nation's youngest radio and television host, David Pacman. Find out more and catch up on all the latest episodes by visiting our website at freespeech.org. It's a big Thursday, September 4. Hello, everybody. The Bill Press Show coming to you live from Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, bringing you the news of the day here on Free Speech TV nationwide. We're there with you. Got a satellite dish. Find us on DirecTV. And worldwide, we're there with you 
on Talker TV. Yeah, President Obama is not the only one in Wales. We're in Wales this morning and Scotland and Ireland and the UK and all across the continent and through Asia and Africa. We're there on Talker TV, youtube.com slash Talker TV. Well, it, while he's in Wales, President Obama meeting with the leaders of 27 other NATO nations. The big item on the agenda, of course, is uh, right nearby, Vladimir Putin, his attempts to wrestle uh, eastern Ukraine out of uh, Ukraine and make it, again, part of Russia. They're going to be talking about that, but President Obama has also scheduled several meetings to try to get some more support for U.S. efforts against ISIS so that we don't go alone if we do uh, ratchet up our uh, war against ISIS uh, in Iraq and Syria. Here in the United States, fast food workers in more than a dozen cities will schedule sit-down strikes today, making the point that they can't survive on 725 and uh, looking for a raise in the minimum wage for fast food workers up to $15 an hour. Good for them. CVS making the big move yesterday. They announced it about a year ago. Yesterday it happened. They are now rid of no longer selling uh, any tobacco products at all, and they are rebranding CVS and calling it now CVS Health. And it looked like for a while that Michael Sam might be out of the closet, but out of the NFL as well. Ain't going to happen. Dallas Cowboys picked him up and signed him up for their practice squad. Good for the Dallas Cowboys. All of that you're going to want to talk about, so give us a call at 866-55-PRESS. This is the Bill Press Show. Tune into Free Speech TV for Democracy Now!, a national, independent, award-winning news program bringing you people and perspectives rarely seen on corporate media. I'm the retired bishop with the Episcopal Church as the bishop for um, all chaplains in federal service. I read that there was a group of people that represented a sense of injustice that I had. We'd lost Zuccotti. I mean, there was a kind of a hope that maybe uh, Trinity Church would um, be gracious and give refuge. We picked this day where we would gather uh, and demonstrate that Trinity was closing its ears to what was happening. We marched around the block, and I realized that, my goodness, they're carrying a ladder. And I thought, well, this is the moment. You could feel a spiritual presence. You could feel a certain something. And then the cops came in. It got brutal. The church needed, in this moment in history, to stand alongside of these protesters. The truth of, of Christ is found in the pews, is found in the institutional church, but it is also found in the streets. It's found um, in the honesty and the integrity, um, the insistence of people that you find in Occupy Wall Street. Tune into Gay USA with hosts Ann Northrup and Andy Hum for in depth coverage of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender news. Watch Gay USA every week only on Free Speech TV. You wouldn't let money just blow out of your house. So when your AC or heater is on, make sure the doors, windows, and fireplace flue are shut tight. If you're headed out, Turn down the AC or lower the heat by 10 degrees. And always keep your water heater set at 120. 
little bit of common sense goes a long way. Get more great tips at energysaver.gov. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Broadcasting around the nation, on your radio, on your TV, and online. This is the Bill Press Show. The leaders of NATO gather in Wales, Ukraine, and ISIS on the agenda, on our agenda too. Hello, hello, hello. Thursday. Thursday, September 4. So good to see you today. And thank you for hopping on board the bus here as we uh, start up, gear up, and head out across the United States of America from our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., and our studio on Capitol Hill. Uh, How good to see you this morning on your local progressive talk or radio station. Thanks for being there. Uh, Thanks for being there on the TuneIn app, if that's how you join us, if you're not lucky enough to have a progressive radio station in your community. The TuneIn app or iHeartRadio, either way, gets us to one of our local affiliates. And on Free Speech TV, those of you visually inclined, it's good to see you. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, Got another purple shirt on this morning. (laughs) Just for you. Don't think that that hasn't gone unnoticed, by the way, by the viewers. I know, I know. That's why I just wear them just for you, because that purple comes across so well on the big screen. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) And worldwide for you, too, on Talker TV, youtube.com slash Talker TV. It's nice to know that in Wales, all those, the leaders of the 27 countries uh, in their hotel rooms in Wales, uh, they can just turn us on Talker TV or or on their computers or their laptops or whatever. And they're... There we are. That's right. So get to work. Back to work. <laughs> no golf. I know the person. Bought, you know, it's a little dangerous because uh, he's in a hotel on a golf course. Oh, boy. At the Celtic Manor Resort yeah, in Wales. And, well, at least it's alongside of a golf course. So, you know, I think they they better really keep their eye on him. He yeah, could just sneak out. He could just slip out there, man. <laughs> and say, oh, where's Barack? Where's Barack? And then they hear, whack. <laughs> Check the golf course. <laughs> there, yeah, there he goes. Uh, anyhow, so uh, thank, you again, thank you again for joining us. Don't forget, uh, you can always really join in. Get your voice heard by giving us a call at 866-55-PRESS and tell, tell us what you think about the news of the day, and you can send us your comments on Twitter at BP Show on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Bill Press Show. All of our thousands and thousands and thousands of friends on Facebook. Peter Ogburn keeps his eye on uh, keeps his eye out for your comments. Uh, here with Elisa Murphy. Hello, go. Hello, hello. Hey, 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 hey. hey. It's already Happy Thursday. Thursday. Already Thursday. Uh, you, you know, know <coughs> I could get used to this whole. So could I. Three day mm-hmm. weekend, four day yep. work week thing. Yeah, I like it. I like it. I mean, you know, you're the boss. You you could make the decision to <laughs> to, uh, to to implement this at the Bill Press show. Lead the fight, Bill. Lead the fight. Yeah, you know what? You could. You <laughs> but uh, here's the deal. Since we can't decide on whether or not to take Fridays or Mondays <laughs> off. I'll take Fridays. You take Mondays. We'll have a three-day work fair. week. That's fair. <laughs> I think that's fair. <laughs> uh, whatever it is, Alicia Cruz is here to take your calls again. Uh, she's on the phones at 866-55-PRESS. And did Cyprian show up this morning? I don't, I don't, I don't, we haven't seen Cyprian, we haven't so seen I don't know Cyprian. if he's here or not. Oh, 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 there he is. There he is. There now he is. you know okay. he's here. Oh, yeah, good. Let's see. The camera's working. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, hi. Yeah. yeah, the cameras are working. So there we go. Well, you know, uh, a lot of people are saying, come on, uh, President Obama, too cautious, you know, uh, when it comes to ISIS. He's just not, he's not showing enough anger, not showing enough passion, not showing enough emotion. He's got to get out there and tell it like it is. Well, that's not his job. That's Joe Biden's job. 
And if you let Uncle Joe, Joe let Joe be Joe, and Joe will say it as he said it yesterday. We will follow them to the gates of hell <laughs> until they are brought to justice. Because hell is where they will reside. Hell is where they will reside. Yeah, right. Go. Follow them to the gates of hell. That's what he's I saying. I like that, man. I like that. I love that rhetoric. I love that language. I love that emotion. And That's right. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I, again, I, I don't care who they are. Hear all these criticisms of Joe Biden. I am a huge Joe Biden fan. And I don't like Joe when he... I mean, I love Joe, but I mean, I don't like it when he tries to be. When he tries to suppress. Suppress, yeah. you know, to be a little more restrained. I like that no, unfiltered just, Biden. Exactly. Unleashed. That's it. Let Joe be Joe. That's it. All right. That should be yeah. the campaign slogan. <laughs> Let Joe be Joe. Let Joe be Joe. <laughs> uh, yeah, mix it up. Hmm, do you think he'll go against Hillary in 26 <laughs> minutes? No. Hey, we got uh, reporter friends coming in today from The Nation and from The Washington Post, of course. Peter Fenn, a Democratic strategist, one of the leading in the country, will be here as a friend of Bill. And we'll be joined by Mary Kay Henry, the president of the SEIU, the major force, driving force behind the fast food workers' strike around the country today. And, you know, if you ever need any proof the death penalty is wrong, 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 we got it for you. But first, this is the Full Court Press. Yes, indeed. Just a couple of other stories making news. We go to Florida, where a 21-year-old man by the name of Daniel Velopatino mm. was up all night doing drugs. He stole thousands of dollars and crashed a Lexus into a police car, so he led cops on a pursuit. How did they catch the man? Well, he got thirsty, so he stopped at someone's house knocked on their door and asked if he could come in and get a glass of water. <laughs> what? He went in. The, the a very concerned couple gave him the glass of water, but when they came back to find him, he had stopped to pet and play with their cat. <laughs> the police knocked on the door, walked in, and arrested the man. So the cats may have actually stopped the, the man's rampage. You know, if he were smart, he wouldn't be... That's uh, right. You got to say, right? That's the, right. The, <laughs> yeah. The criminals are not necessarily the smartest people on the planet. That's right. right. That's right. We're going to get a better look at The View. The ABC daytime talk show has a lot of holes to fill, but they filled them last night. Is Barbara coming back? We knew that Barbara Walters was leaving. We knew that Rosie O'Donnell was coming back and joining Whoopi Goldberg, so we had two other seats to fill. We found out who they were last night. Rosie Perez. Is one of them. So we've got two. We've got dueling oh, Rosies no. oh, uh -oh. on the show. Rosie Perez, the actress who was in White Men Can't Jump, among other several uh, movies, and Republican commentator, political commentator Nicole Wallace. Oh, joining huh. the View. Oh, huh, really? Very interesting selection. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, you know Elizabeth She's, Hasselbeck used to right, be in that right. chair. So they Nicole Wallace is very smart. She very is good. She yeah, is. It's indeed. interesting. She's been on Morning Joe a lot. Mm -hmm. I wonder if she can't. Uh, well, she might be able to do both. Uh, contractually, I don't know. She may have given up NBC yeah, for tough. ABC. Yeah, it might be. I don't, I'm not sure if they'll let her do it. But, right. Yeah. And you know, Dante Stallworth is a former NFL player. He's a fan of the Bill Press show, as we know. He's very politically active. Yeah. He, yeah. At, once he left the NFL, he became very politically active, covers a lot of progressive issues. We know he talks to Joe Sirizioni a lot on Twitter. It's very entertaining. Well, yesterday, oh, was that right? Yeah. 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 Yesterday, it no, was he's, more, he's part of our team here. Absolutely, absolutely. Yesterday, it was announced he is going to be joining Huffington Post as a reporter. Wow. He's going to be covering national security for Huffington Post. Former NFL player Dante Stallworth. So good for him. There is life after the NFL. All right. He's a smart dude. Yeah. He knows what he's talking that. about. Good. All right. We'll go. have to get him in. Sure, absolutely. Again, from the mm -hmm. Puffington host. That's uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as I said, this story. You know, you know, it's every day, and you're part of the team, so you understand, right? You know, we got to huddle. We got to think about, all right, what's going on? You know, where do we start? Because what's what's the story that really grips us today? Do we start with ISIS again? Hmm, maybe. Do we start with a fast food strike today? Hmm, that's a good possibility. But this is the story that really grips me and that really hit me yesterday. 
was a story out of North Carolina. And, of course, any time I've got an excuse to go to North Carolina, I'll go there, whether it's the Outer Banks or to my favorite city, on one of my favorite cities on the planet, Asheville, North Carolina, 880 The Revolution. Hello, hello. All of our good friends in Asheville. But this story out of North Carolina is incredible. It is both heartwarming and frustrating at the same time. And, of course, I'm talking about the release from prison yesterday of brothers Henry Lee McCollum and Leon Brown, uh, half-brothers. Uh, but it's, it's just so unbelievable. And I, if you know what happened, and this, this is it. If you are looking for any argument that the death penalty is wrong, it is immoral, it should be illegal, and certainly is imperfect, this is it. The story of these two brothers, they, the, the, you know, the gist of it is they were released from pres, prison yesterday after serving 30 years for a crime they did not commit. They signed, a, they were forced to sign, and they did sign when they were teenagers, uh, a confession to raping and murdering a, a little 11-year-old girl. They did not commit the crime, and DNA at the time, if we had that science at the time, the evidence, there was a very weak case in the beginning, very, very weak case against them. The, 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 basically, the entire case was their confession, which, afraid of the cops, hello, young black male in North Carolina yeah. 30 years ago. Yeah, I, I'd be scared of the cops. Afraid of the cops. They, they signed this confession, and the police dropped the case. We got him. We got him. Boom. Put him in prison. One of them, Henry Lee McCollum, on death row for most of that 30 years. Uh, and uh, there are attorneys, you know, in the Innocence Project who just didn't give up on this case. And they finally uh, got the courts to reconsider it. They looked at the DNA evidence, and the DNA evidence clearly pointed to another man who lived very close to the victim and, by the way, who is in serving a life sentence right now for rape and murder oh, of geez. another woman. So, I mean, the, 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 basically, the culprit was staring them in the face, and instead they went after these two guys. When they walked out yesterday and reunited with their family, family uh, Henry Lee McCollum saying, no, you know, um, he's glad to be out, but he doesn't hate the people, can't hate the people who put him away. I don't like what they done to me and my brother because they, they, they took 30 years away from me from no, for no reason, but I don't hate him. I don't hate him one bit. Took 30 years away, but I don't hate him. He's just, he's just happy to be out. I'm happy. I'm very um, emotional. I want to, you know, thank God. For the glory. Yeah. Tell you I, something. That guy's a lot more put together than I would be if I was in his shoes. Boy. Yeah. You said, yeah, I'd have a lot of hate. Uh, absolutely. I'd have a lot of hate. I, I, I would. I'd, I'd sort of want to get even with some people. Yeah. Right. But so, but this is a big... So thank God they got these guys out, these two guys out. It's, it's just, a, a, you know, shame on all of us that, um, that we're in a society that where, this, where this could happen even 30 years ago. Uh, but it could still happen today, you know. But it says so much to me uh, for, for on a, uh, the issue is a lot broader than just these two guys. It speaks to the whole issue of conduct of the police force and whether they really are looking at the evidence, doing their job, or jumping to conclusions still today. Hello, Ferguson, when it comes to a young black man. But it also speaks to the death penalty. I mean, imagine if we had executed that guy. We could easily have done so. There are still 152 men on death row in North Carolina. What are the chances do you think that they are all guilty? I'd say zero. Zero chance. You know, I mean, we've seen this time after time after time. These cases come up, and yet we've got, and people say, that you know we've got we have to have this death penalty for whatever reason you know to revenge is about the only reason that, that people when you boil down to it that it comes up to but it is a it is a it is the final solution for a less than final and certainly a less than perfect system 
uh, because if you execute an innocent man, you have killed an innocent man. I mean, and, and or woman, and there's no way coming back. And the, the the other thing about this death penalty is this was the poster boy case for the death penalty for Antonin Scalia and the justices on the Supreme Court who still up, want to uphold the death penalty and leave it up to states as to whether they use it or not. Twenty years ago. Uh, Anton Scalia, when the Supreme Court, Su- Supreme Court was uh, arguing the death penalty, and Harry Blackman, then a justice at the case, argued that the death penalty was unconstitutional, Anton and Scalia pushed back. Okay, He said, no, no, no. Here's an obvious example of a man who deserved to be put to death. Here's Scalia. This is what he wrote. For example... The case of an 11-year-old girl raped by four men and then killed by stuffing her panties down her throat. How enviable a quiet death by lethal injection compared with that. And Scalia said, Henry Lee McCollum, this proves why we need the death penalty. No, it doesn't. This proves why it's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to today when Anthony Scalia comes out and says, I was wrong. Mm, I wouldn't hold your breath. We can't trust the death penalty. We've got to make it unconstitutional. We have to make it illegal. We have to take that away from all 50 states. Do you think it's going to happen today? I wouldn't hold your breath. 866-55 press. Let's talk about it. Isn't this, isn't this the time to reconsider the death penalty and to get rid of it? What more evidence do we need? Out of North Carolina comes the case. This is the Bill Press Show. Tune into Free Speech TV for Democracy Now!, a national, independent, award-winning news program bringing you people and perspectives rarely seen on corporate media. Grunt work. <laughs> Love it, hate it, useful, not useful. Necessary. Our social entrepreneurs are people who have been on the front lines of social change. I've learned so much from talking with them. This is Cafe Impact, and I'm Jonathan Lewis. I will say that I think is a challenge for anyone, especially um, the new workforce as they come in, is the ability to accept grant work with grace. The most boring, awful details are the most important elements of doing this work. From the way you save names in your Rolodex to the way you bank and you deposit checks. The truth is this work isn't glamorous, it's rewarding. You don't go into this for the glamour, you go into it for the for the impact. And so it takes that determination to do the scut work to actually get anywhere. It can be really challenging in a first job for someone who's coming out of finishing school to have the enthusiasm that they do to make the type of social impact that they've dreamed of. And now they're here in this first job and all of a sudden they're shouldered with all this grunt work. And they don't understand and they don't get it. And they're resentful. Talk more about the power of it. Answering phones. <laughs> I sure, I, I did that myself. You know, took out the trash, you know, clean, mm. cleaned offices when I had to, and it's all good. There's power in, in being a good team player and in, in being somebody who sometimes has to support other people's leadership before you get to have your own moment in the sun. Is it hard to wait? It, it is absolutely hard to wait, especially if you're an alpha female like I. I think grunt work can help a new employee build trust internally and and teach them the nuances of how an organization is run so that they can have a real good sense of what HR is doing, what finance is doing, what all the other departments are, and that actually makes them a better employee in the long run. So in my role on a daily basis, I literally can be looking at a new venture in software. Mm -hmm. Um, We could be looking at a microfinance deal. I could be making coffee, taking out the trash, and riding a tractor on any given day. Have you found people who thought it was demeaning that they were 
given his job, work in the front office and make the coffee when they graduated with all A's from this great university. And, yeah, uh, people like that just don't last very long in our world. If your approach to life is that, you know, you're so smart and you're such a fabulous entrepreneur that you can't understand why people aren't giving you opportunities, it's really hard to advance. Tune into Gay USA with hosts Ann Northrup and Andy Hum for in depth coverage of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender news. Watch Gay USA every week only on Free Speech TV. What the frack? What the frack? What the frack? President Obama, are you fracking kidding me? Reopen the EPA studies. In Texas, Wyoming, and Pennsylvania. Fracking pollutes our oceans. Fracking poisons our water. Fracking makes climate change worse. Fracking relies on toxic chemicals that cause cancer. Ban fracking now. Ban fracking now. Go on. Ban it. Ban, Ban fracking now. now. Please. This is the Bill Press Show. 26 minutes after the hour. By the way, uh, we're talking about the release of these two men from Death Row, half brothers. Both, by the way, mentally uh, unbalanced or disabled. 30 years in prison for a crime they did not commit. Antonin Scalia said 20 years ago when he made the argument for keeping the death penalty legal uh, that they, these guys proved why we need the death penalties. We haven't heard from Antonin Scalia since it was proven that they were not guilty. Um, but also as recently as 2010, the North Carolina Republican Party used a picture of Leon Henry, uh, Henry Lee McCollum, rather, uh, who was on death row and used his picture to attack Democrats as being soft on crime because there were people who wanted him released from prison. Yeah, they were doing the right thing. Uh, Tony, out in Fairview Heights, Illinois, Illinois, um, where the governor of Illinois, Republican governor of Illinois, uh, did away with the death penalty because they had so many people on death row who uh, were exonerated by DNA. Hello, Tony. Uh, good morning, Bill. Revenge is for suckers. That's what was said in the sting. That's all I have to say here about that. I mean, they, they'll keep trying to do something like that, but it's never going to work. Thank you. It's, okay. Tony, appreciate hearing from you. I, I remember, think, I think there were like 12 or 13 or something they found on death row in Illinois. And finally, I forget his name now, but the governor, I think he's still in, I think he's in prison for some other crime. But he finally said, you know, we, we can't continue doing this. We right. can't execute the people on death row when so many people are found not guilty. I, I understand why people want to have this revenge mentality that he was just talking about. I understand why you feel like there should be a severe, severe punishment for a horrible crime like that. But you've got to get it right. You've got to know without a doubt that what you're doing is the right thing. And we don't know that. There's no way to know. There's no way to know. No, There's no, no way to know. Uh, and then, uh, it, even if we do, I would make the argument. I would make the argument still that uh, there are other arguments against the death penalty as well. Sure. But this is certainly uh, all that we need, I think, to take this right away from states and to make it illegal all across the country. Eight six six fifty five. Press more calls is coming the up. Bill Press Show. This is my computer. This is your computer. Let's go on the internet. Let's go. Click it. Yes. Okay. I cursor in between the R and the E. Racing down a bunch of just much debris. She's gonna love me all over again. That's it? Jamaica, here you go? Here we go. <laughs> Good right. job. Thank you. Thank you. And I did it by myself. Feel smarter. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? 
that's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide and go seek. Same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. All right. I know this isn't any fun to talk about, but we should. Okay. So who's going to do what? I'll pack the dead batteries. Great. I'll only put what I don't need into a duffel bag. Perfect. That's totally unhelpful. No problem. Meanwhile, I will try to comfort everyone by speaking in a calm voice. And I'll try to get the generator going without any gas. Oh, let's not forget the cell phones, which probably won't work. Right. And who is going to handle supplies? I can forget to do a list for us. Thanks, pal. Well, I think we couldn't be any less prepared. I'm proud of you guys. Talk to your kids about who to call, where to meet, what to pack. Visit ready.gov slash kids for tips and information. Hey, thanks for stopping by. You know, I, I followed your character since the first episode. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Big, big fan. Thank you. And listen, your storyline, it makes for incredible TV drama. The thing is, your drug use is very adult content. Too adult for the kids. So I'm going to have to block you. Well, have a good one. You're a nice lady. At Earth Justice, we defend the environment in the courtroom. Join our fight. When you take a seat, you take a stand. Earth Justice, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. Tune in to Gay USA with hosts Ann Northrup and Andy Hum for in-depth coverage of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender news. Watch Gay USA every week, only on Free Speech TV. Life Lock Ultimate Plus is the way to stop them. And the way that you can uh, join in is either... Here we go at 34 minutes after the hour now. 
Back to you, back to your calls on the release of these two half-brothers from uh, prison yesterday, one of them from death row in North Carolina, serving 30 years uh, for a crime they did not commit. Uh, And these were the poster children, the poster boys, if you will, for the proponents of the death penalty, the one they kept pointing to, (coughs) starting, I'm sorry, with Justice Antonin Scalia pointing to this. See, this is why we need the death penalty. Look at these guys. Yeah, they, that, that's, that, that's all the proof that you need, and it turns out they were dead wrong. And by the way, you know, the one thing that struck me last night in reading about the case this morning, so they've spent 30 years in prison. They went away as teenagers. Yeah. Imagine what it's like to walk out of there. Oh. I mean, right? Yeah. Yeah, this one guy, it says on death row, get this. Mr. McCollum was never allowed to open a door, never allowed to turn on a light switch, never allowed to use a zipper, had never had a cell phone. <laughs> What's a cell phone? Had never, until just recently... What's a smartphone? ...used the internet or, or What's even... What's email? Known, exactly. No, exactly. He, he sat in the car to, to, that was people who were driving him away, he had no idea what a seatbelt was. He had no idea how to use a seatbelt. Never used one. That'll in. blow your mind. Think that of that. Blo- like, that blows my mind. Yeah. I mean, I saw the guy said, no, you take this across you now, and you put it down here, and you click it. In here. Holy cow. The guy's 50 years old. You know, <laughs> that's cr- I mean, that, 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 that will blow your mind out of the water. Yeah. Yeah. It's so scary to think that we were that close. And think how many people, I mean, I forget. I've and this happens often well, enough to where often, we talk about it a couple enough. times a year. And, and by the way, this is a great heartwarming story. How about all the stories yeah. of the people who did not, who were killed, who, who were killed? And there's a long list of killed for crimes that they did not commit. Let's go back to the phones. 866-55-PRESS. Uh, you want to to me, this is all the arguments you need. I don't know. We just don't talk about it anymore. We just accept the fact that we're the only civilized nation on earth that still has the death penalty, and we accept that that's just who we are as Americans. No, it's not. It should not be. Robert in Lawrence, South Carolina. Hey, Robert. In 1944, South Carolina electrocuted a 14-year-old boy under similar circumstances. Is that right? That's yeah. Correct. Uh, they made a movie about it. It's called Carolina Skeletons. Ooh. Yeah. Sure and uh, uh, I think they should do away with the death penalty, except maybe for somebody like a Hitler or a John Wayne Gacy or somebody like that. Uh, yeah, well, I think if you're going to do away with it, you do away with it for, for everybody, Robert. But I appreciate, appreciate your call. You know, I, I'm sure we could all there, – there are so many examples around the country uh, of this. In fact, uh, I, read, I read one. I'm just looking here. It was, wasn't that long ago. Yeah, in, in, uh, even in North Carolina, right, uh, a guy from Chapel Hill, Lamont Burton Armstrong – um, wrongly convicted of the 19, 1988 murder of a North Carolina a and professor. He was released from prison in March 2013, again, when the DNA, this is the same state, uh, when the DNA proved that, uh, that he did not commit that crime. Uh, before we move on here, here's Marsha. Marsha's calling me out from Dwight, North Dakota. All right. Hello, Marsha. Hi. Love your show. Thank you. Um, I- just wanted to say that I have, I know women who have killed, and, and they've killed their rapists. And um, the death penalty stops nothing. It, it makes no difference whatsoever. They would have done what they did no matter what the penalty was. Well, Mars, that's a good point. I mean, you know, it used to be uh, the fact, the deterrent, right? That was the argument for the death penalty, right? That if, if people knew that if they did this, they were going to be put to death. They would never do that crime. That has never been proven true, right? Exactly. No, exactly. In the passion of the moment, in the heat of the moment, in the stupidity of the moment, or whatever, they go. They, you know, they're just they'll, they'll commit these crimes. They're not thinking. They're not thinking it through. Their logic and everything. It's it, it was the craziest argument. But I remember. I mean, when I was in high school, debating the death penalty. The deterrent was always the argument. Right. Oh man, they know they if they know they do this, they're going to get the death penalty. Man, they'll never rob a bank. They'll never kill anybody. Right? 
that it's just not true. No, I mean statistics true. don't back that up. Places that have a higher death penalty rate, it's not it, crime hasn't gone down, murder hasn't gone down. They can't prove that that's the case. I don't think anybody today actually makes the argument of deterrence right. anymore. Right, they've given up on it. You're right. Yeah, I they mean, I think they just accept the fact that nobody believes it. Right. Yeah. And I'm I'm telling you, when you when you boil down all the arguments in support of the death penalty, the only one you're left with is revenge. Revenge. That that um, this is what they did to them, so we have to do just as bad to them. In other words, we have to become like them. And that's why we need the death penalty, which is pretty sad. We even saw a lot of that, like with these botched death penalties that we've seen a couple of those oh, in yeah, the past couple yeah. months. People go, "Oh, well, you know, this guy that it took, you know, hours for he him deserved to die. It he deserved of, it because he did this horrible did. thing to these people, right. and that is so barbaric." I mean, it, it's and, and you know, uh, I hate to boil this down to uh, to money. In this country, everything boils down to money, sure. right? Um, you, as you pointed out, the Dallas Cowboys hiring Michael Sam, a lot of it was because they knew they could make a lot of money. Money, 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 money. But even if, as a conservative, you're concerned about the cost of the death penalty, it is study after study after study has proven it is much cheaper to keep somebody in prison yeah. for life, life in prison without parole, so that no no way they can get out, and we've got prisons that are you can't escape from today. No way, no how. Much cheaper to keep somebody in, for life in prison without parole than to go through the endless um, appeals and hearings and court cases and proceedings and all of that for people on death row. Yeah, it's been proven. I mean, it's much much the death penalty is much much more expensive. So even from a cheap you know, dollars, <laughs> dimes and dollars point of view, is a, a, there's every reason, every possible reason to get rid of the death penalty. But, of course, you got blockheads like Anthony Scalia on the uh, Supreme Court. Again, I really, I, I, really, I really wonder what Scalia is thinking today and wonder whether we're going to – he may find some way to say, I was still right, right? I'm sure he will. Oh, well, this is just an exception. Okay, all right, I was wrong in this case, but look at all these other cases or something like that. He'll never admit he was wrong. Never, never. It's, people should use the Antonin Scalia stuff every time that the death penalty comes up, right? For every mm -hmm. person who's so sure mm -hmm. that they've got the answer, the final – sort of answer on why the death penalty works. Just say, you know what? The Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia thought he had it all figured out too. He was right. dead wrong. I think they should do be out more than that. I think they should use this this uh, example for anything that Scalia says about anything. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and every time he opens his mouth about anything, right? <laughs> A campaign finance for, for for example, right? Yeah, but or abortion or uh, voting rights or anything. Just say, yeah, hey, uh, what is his, what's his nickname? Noni, Noni. I think that I think it's Noni that they call him. It's his nickname. Yeah, hey Noni, how are those two brothers in North Carolina? Yeah. Huh? How'd that work out, <laughs> Noni? Shh, <laughs> All right. Hey, when we come back, I mentioned Michael Sam just a couple of minutes ago uh, from the Nation. Uh, Michael Smith. As been writing about Michael Sam, we thought he was out of the closet and out of the NFL. Looks like he has a new lease on life. We'll get into that when we come back. This is the Bill Press Show. Just this month, my bill was like $138. Even at one phone call a week, it cost me 40 to $50 every month. I am living on a fixed income of SSI, so this is really a great hardship. Families are being punished. When they incarcerate their children, they incarcerate the whole family. In 2011, the Media Action Grassroots Network, Working Narratives, and Prison Legal News founded the Campaign for Prison Phone Justice 
an effort to call on the FCC to address the cost of interstate phone calls. The campaign mobilized prisoners to send hundreds of letters. Advocates and families filled out postcards, met with elected officials, and signed petitions. Partnerships were formed across the political spectrum and with groups in the criminal justice, civil rights, and public interest community. The film distribution company, Participant Media, and director Ava DuVernay joined the fight through a social action campaign tied to the release of the feature film, Middle of Nowhere. In an effort to push the FCC to act, the campaign hosted a historic rally outside of the Federal Communications Commission where for the first time, families of prisoners, elected officials, civil rights and faith leaders came together to call for an end to predatory phone rates. We're all held captive when predatory phone companies gouge our families. My son has been incarcerated now for over 10 years, and my husband estimates that in the time we spent over $25,000 on prison phone calls. My hero's not yours, you probably arrested them. Your school's probably neglected them. They spawn thoughts, you probably infected them. Feed us with your feed us, you can lay us next to them. FBI call it major crimes. Babies making babies cry. Two anti-government, self-described revolutionaries have shot up a pizza restaurant as well as a Walmart in Las Vegas. The internationally syndicated political series, The David Pacman Show, provides progressive talk, analysis, and interviews with the nation's youngest radio and television host, David Pacman. Find out more and catch up on all the latest episodes by visiting our website at freespeech.org. is the Bill Press Show. 30 minutes before the uh, top of the hour, um, we are sending a check to the Nation magazine so they can afford to buy alarm clocks for uh, for their reporters. Because <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, uh, Michael Smith didn't quite make it this morning. Huh? Wake up! You? Come on, Michael. Wake up! Wake Come up. on. Come on. Get out of bed. <laughs> Damn it. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> We've been on the air almost almost an hour now. On, Where man. the hell are you? All right. At any rate, uh, Michael Smith was going to. But let, let's just say um, that um, <laughs> we're sorry you didn't join us. But we're very happy with the news that Michael Sam was picked up. You reported this yesterday, Peter. And uh, uh, he has um, signed with the Dallas Cowboys yeah. as part of their uh, practice team. He tweeted out yesterday he grew up in, or spent some time in Texas. He always looked up to the Cowboys organization, and so he's he's now a Cowboy. Now, go out and prove yourself. Yeah. You've yeah. been given the chance. Yeah, it's going to be it. practice squad, which which means he's got a shot, you know, if he proves himself. But he works out with the team, yep. right? And... Um, the 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 point is too. You know, he's the first openly gay man as part of the NFL. I think yeah. it's important in the NFL that they do find a slot for him. As you point out, he'll make lots of money for the team. That's right. Because his jerseys are going to be you know be a big big seller. Yeah. And Michael Smith, if um, Elisa's uh, occupied there, but uh, he he yesterday uh, spoke to reporters and talked about the fact Michael Sam that really. Uh, he was there for for one reason only, the same reason that the Dallas Cowboys got out on the field every day. Yeah. Any way I can use my uh, my speed or my the well, things I learned at St. Louis, uh, anything I can do to help this team uh, win games. And you know, we I'm I'm hungry for for to be on the team and to help a team win. And I'm sure that Dallas wants to you know win as well. That's what it's all about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, period, period. Just forget That's the it. other stuff. And even the idea, which reporters had to ask him, okay, whoa, are your teammates, you know, nervous about, <laughs> did they say anything to you about, mm, we don't want you to shower with us or anything? Michael uh, Michael Sam saying yesterday, uh, their reaction of his fellow teammates was just the opposite. 
Tony Romo, the quarterback, uh, you know, say, hey, welcome. Uh, now let's get to work. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Witten came to me, the same, pretty much the same thing. So these guys, uh, it's about football, you know. They want to they win. So they, they think that can help them win, and that's what I'm going to do. That's yeah. the thing. That's they, it. Yeah. <laughs> some, of these, some of these owners might be hung up on, on the issue. Some aren't, clearly, but some of them might be. But the players don't care. No. They don't care. They care if he can tackle. They care, uh, you know, if he can rack up some sacks. They care if he puts in the work. They don't care. They don't care. No. They just don't care. If you're a good football player, they'll take you in. Right. If you don't work and you suck, they don't care if you're gay or straight or whatever. It's more the sports reporters also who are who are sure. obsessed by this, right? Sure. And uh, ESPN doing yeah. the story about the you know the the shower and all that kind of stuff. M- moving on. Um, so, uh, Michael Sam. Good. He's got that slot. Uh, the other big news, of course, uh, that we just wanted to touch on, not lose sight of, and that is still the outstanding question of uh, what the American response is going to be to the threat of ISIS, more and more uh, calls on the part of Republicans and Democrats in Congress to um, go ahead with airstrikes against ISIS positions inside of Syria. Uh, the president is taking a more cautious turn. Uh, that's certainly under consideration, but he wants to kind of get his ducks in a row ahead of time. But among the voices that we heard yesterday, uh, the strongest saying, no doubt, no doubt, we're going to get these guys, came from Vice President Joe Biden, who said, this is how far we will follow them. We will follow them to the gates of hell right. until they are brought to justice. <laughs> Because hell is where they will reside. Hell is where they will reside. Hell too good for them. Joe (laughs) Biden, yeah, he lays it out there. Senator Dianne Feinstein, who just Sunday on Meet the Press, said that she thought President Obama, she knew he's cautious. She said, in this case, perhaps too cautious. Uh, And she made the point yesterday, speaking to a group down in the Silicon Valley of California, that, uh, look, we're going to get, we know, we know we're going to have to do this. So basically she's saying, why not do it now? I have no doubt. We'll either fight them now or we'll fight them later because they're not going to stop. We will fight them now or fight or fight them later. And another strong voice from the administration, Secretary of State John Kerry yesterday saying, uh, here we are, this may be the most lethal terrorist group we've ever faced, but we've faced terrorist groups before, we know what to do, and uh, we'll do it again. We have taken the fight to this kind of savagery and evil before, and believe me, we will take it again. And President Obama's position, again, is that uh, there's no doubt that he wants, he said, he repeated this yesterday, Uh, both in Estonia and when he arrived in Wales, that our mission is to, as he puts it, to degrade and destroy ISIS. Uh, In order to do so, first he wants to make sure that new coalition government in Iraq is up and running, and secondly, that he's got the support of um, other nations in the region uh, who will provide ground troops to follow up on American airstrikes to finish the job. 866 press is our toll-free number. Join us anytime on any topic we're talking about on this Thursday, September 4. We'll be right back. This is The Bill Press Show. What the frack? What the frack? What the frack? What the frack? President Obama, are you fracking kidding me? Reopen the EPA studies. In Texas, Wyoming, and Pennsylvania. Fracking pollutes our oceans. Fracking poisons our water. Fracking makes climate change worse. Fracking relies on toxic chemicals that cause cancer. Ban fracking now. Ban fracking now. Go on. Ban it. Ban Ban fracking now. Please. A few years ago, plastic bag waste in our city came to a tipping point. It was clear, we had a bag problem. 
My department was tasked to reduce plastic bag consumption. We needed to come up with ways to change human behavior. So we asked ourselves, we should I get by? What do people really hate? Yep. Getting punched in the stomach. Uh, oh. uh. Preliminary studies showed that the consequences weren't severe enough to warrant behavioral change. Actually, can I get that double bagged? So we thought, what do people hate more than getting punched in the stomach? Kissing Helga. Hey, big boy. People didn't find her so offensive after all, so we had to get creative. How many bags? Okay now, pour this ice water down your pants. <laughs> we tried everything. Ah! <laughs> Eat the threat. Defuse this bomb. Even fighting your clone. After blowing through millions of dollars of government funds on research, I came up with a brilliant idea. Why don't we just charge five cents per bag? That's a stupid idea. Would you like a bag? Yes. Five cents a bag. Five cents? Five cents? Do I still have the option of getting punched? Honestly, I don't know how everyone else missed it. Why don't you just get a reusable bag? At Earth Justice, we defend the environment in the courtroom. Join our fight. When you take a seat, you take a stand. Earth Justice, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. This is the Bill Press Show. All right, on this Thursday, September 4, in the next hour, Shane Goldmacher from the National Journal joins us, as well as Rebecca Cinderbrand, uh, covers politics for the Washington Post. Uh, Peter. 2016, 2016, 2016. I know we don't talk about it much, but I, I, I just had to get this story out there because the Wall Street <laughs> Journal is reporting that Martin O'Malley, governor of Maryland, told Democratic fundraisers that he is going to run for president whether Hillary Clinton runs or not. He told them, quote, uh, she needs to face at least some competition from an established elected official, end quote. He thinks that's him. Again, the Wall Street Journal reporting that. So he's, he's in. He, ha he certainly hasn't made it official, but he's running for president. If he's telling donors that, you know, then that's a good that's sign. That's his plan. That he's raising money. Uh, you know, he's been a good governor of Maryland. He's a good guy. I know him. I like him. Um, My governor? Think, there you go. state of Maryland? I, I like the guy a lot. There you go. And uh, it's certainly, and he knows this, an uphill battle. Uh, but I do agree with him on this, that I think it's very important that the Democratic primary be a Democratic primary and not a coronation for Hillary Clinton. And that's why, uh, you know, we've been urging Bernie Sanders to run, urging Elizabeth Warren to run, and we will uh, certainly urge and join those urging uh, Martin O'Malley to run. Yeah. Uh, I've been thinking about it. I haven't made up my mind yet. <laughs> anyway. This is the Bill Press Show. All right, I know this isn't any fun to talk about, but we should. Okay, so who's going to do what? I'll pack the dead batteries. Great. I'll only put what I don't need into a duffel bag. Perfect, that's totally unhelpful. No problem. Meanwhile, I will try to comfort everyone by speaking in a calm voice. And I'll try to get the generator going without any gas. Oh, let's not forget the cell phones, which probably won't work. Right. And who is going to handle supplies? I can forget to do a list for us. Thanks, pal. Well, I think we couldn't be any less prepared. I'm proud of you guys. 
talk to your kids about who to call, where to meet, what to pack. Visit ready.gov slash kids for tips and information. It's a big Thursday, September 4. Hello, everybody. The Bill Press Show coming to you live from Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, bringing you the news of the day here on Free Speech TV nationwide. We're there with you. Got a satellite dish. Find us on Direct TV and worldwide. We're there with you on Talker TV. Yeah, President Obama is not the only one in Wales. We're in Wales this morning and Scotland, and Ireland, and the UK, and all across the continent and through Asia and Africa. We're there on Talker TV, youtube.com slash Talker TV. Well, it, while he's in Wales, President Obama meeting with the leaders of 27 other NATO nations. The big item on the agenda, of course, is uh, right nearby, Vladimir Putin, his attempts to wrestle... Uh, eastern Ukraine out of uh, Ukraine and make it again part of Russia. They're going to be talking about that, but President Obama has also scheduled several meetings to try to get some more support for U.S. efforts against ISIS so that we don't go alone if we do uh, ratchet up our uh, war against ISIS uh, in Iraq and Syria. Here in the United States, fast food workers in more than a dozen cities will schedule sit-down strikes today making the point that they can't survive on 725 and uh, looking for a raise in the minimum wage for fast food workers up to $15 an hour. Good for them. CVS making the big move yesterday. They announced it about a year ago. Yesterday it happened. They are now rid of no longer selling uh, any tobacco products at all, and they are rebranding CVS and calling it now CVS Health. And it looked like for a while that Michael Sam might be out of the closet, but out of the NFL as well. Ain't going to happen. Dallas Cowboys picked him up and signed him up for their practice squad. Good for the Dallas Cowboys. All of that you're going to want to talk about. So give us a call at 866-55-PRESS. This is the Bill Press Show. gets you into college? Good SAT scores? High GPA? Lots of extracurriculars? Sure, but what you really need is money. If you don't have the cash, you'll need a loan. And we mean huge student loans because the cost of college has risen 1,000% in the last 30 years. This means big money for the banks that collect fees and interest. Now, millions of young people are starting their adult lives with an average of $29,000 of loans on their backs. Altogether, we're talking $1.2 trillion in student debt. And more and more people are finding it impossible to pay them back. Welcome to the student debt crisis. The increasing demand for higher education and cuts to state funding gave colleges a huge incentive to keep inflating prices. I graduated about a year ago, currently in $35,000 of debt. I am in debt about like $25,000. I owe $23,000. I owe over $50,000 in student loans. 38.8 million Americans owe money on a student loan. And the biggest names in banking are making huge profits off the booming student loan industry. Sally May, the largest provider of private student loans, made $949 million last year. They only give you about six months to look for a job. You have to start paying like that, back the loan. Like it's, it's very pressuring, especially nowadays. It's very hard to find a job. Over half of the students graduating in 2012 could not find a decent paying job. They either had low wage jobs or unpaid internships or were unemployed altogether. So you can't make the payments. You start incurring late fees, which makes the loan even harder to pay off. And it stays with you for years, even decades. Right now, a third of the people who started repaying their loans are delinquent or in default. That's 13.7 million people, more than the populations of Chicago, New York, and San Francisco combined. Worse, it's not just the borrowers who are in trouble. Many loans require co-signers. So if the student is unable to pay, that co-signer, a father, a mother, or a grandparent, is now on the hook. Even a grandparent's social security benefits can be garnished to pay the loan. We should have an answer to this. 
If you get really behind in your car payment or your credit cards, you can file for bankruptcy. But Congress has made it nearly impossible to discharge student loans through bankruptcy. Big institutions make big profits while students try to make ends meet under crushing debt. Is this how we want our education system to work? The whole point of going to college is to get the career you want, but I've, lately that's been discouraged because no one can afford school. You get a job just to pay off your student loans. We need higher education, not higher debt. Sign up to end the student debt crisis at higherednotdebt.org. Two anti-government, self-described revolutionaries have shot up a pizza restaurant as well as a Walmart in Las Vegas. The internationally syndicated political series, The David Pacman Show, provides progressive talk, analysis, and interviews with the nation's youngest radio and television host, David Pacman. Find out more and catch up on all the latest episodes by visiting our website at freespeech.org. Broadcasting around the nation, on your radio, on your TV, and online. This is the Bill Press Show. Leaders of 28 NATO nations gather in Wales on the agenda. Ukraine and ISIS, of course. Hello, everybody. Welcome on this Thursday, September 4. Welcome to the Bill Press Show as we reach out to you from our nation's capital and our studio on Capitol Hill, all across this great land of ours, one, on your local progressive talk radio station, two, on either of the radio apps, TuneIn app or iHeartRadio, get either one, download them, they're free. Reaching out to you also on Free Speech TV nationwide and worldwide on our video stream, youtube.com slash talker TV. Good to see you today. You're looking good, and so is the team this morning, Peter Ockburn and Elisa Murphy. Yo, hey, yo, yo. good morning. What do you know? We're huh? here. Here we are. Live and direct. Uh, <laughs> and awake, <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Uh, Alicia Cruz here on the phones. She's here to take your calls. You know, you can join us at 866-55-PRESS, our toll-free number. You can send us your comments on Twitter, at BP Show, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Bill Press Show. And uh, those of you who are watching on Free Speech TV or on worldwide on our video stream, Talker TV, uh, give thanks and join me in giving thanks to Cyprian Balding, our videographer keeping us looking good. I got to tell you, man, it was um, heart attack time again last night for Nats fans. You. Man, what a game. Carol and I watched the game, at least a good chunk of the game, the game that would not stop. Uh, they had it wrapped up. They, they had, bottom they, of the ninth. They had it wrapped up bottom of the ninth. Uh, didn't get it. The Dodgers had it wrapped up Drop time ball, and yeah. time and time again. So it was the LA, uh, the Nats versus the Dodgers out at Dodger Stadium in the Chavez Ravine. It went into the 14th. Neither team could put it away. No. It, it went into the – the Dodgers actually left the bases loaded two innings in a row in the in overtime, in, 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 in extra in innings, innings yeah. right? I mean, You just, do that, you deserve to lose. Yeah, absolutely. End of story. No, they deserve to lose. Yeah. And, you know, coming from L.A., it was a little tense for me to have to, you know, choose between the Dodgers and Come the Nats. Come on now, you can't straddle that fence. Yeah, you uh, gotta... <laughs> no, no, no. no, I was there for the Dodgers, but poor Carol, who's the number one Dodgers, I mean, Nats fan, rather, of all time. Man, she was just having a heart attack because yeah. the Nats couldn't win it, get waiting for the wake. Program. They're killing their fans. And finally, <laughs> in the 14th inning, second baseman, uh, Astrobal Cabrera up to the plate. The 2-1 from Correa. Cabrera blasts one high and deep to right field. Sending Puig back, way back toward the corner. He's on the run, and this one gone! It's into the Nationals' bullpen. He just missed one in the 12th. He did not miss here in the 14th. And the Dodgers are in first place out there, aren't they? They're not bad. They're not a yeah. bad team. Yeah. So, I mean, but, uh, boy, it went on and on. But good for the Nats. But another one, man. No doubt. Nats, what are they, six and a half now up? Uh... 
six and I'm a half, not seven, sure. I, whatever. I don't say. I'm but not clearly, sure first place. First in place, the far and away, yeah. Headed for the playoffs. Can't wait to get my tickets as well. All right. Hey, coming up, Shane the Goldmacher, who covers Congress for the National Journal, joined us here at the top of the hour. Rebecca Cinderbrand from Washington Post. And at the half, and in the next hour, Democratic strategist Peter Fenn and the president of the SEIU, Mary Kay Henry, the driving force behind today's fast food strikes, will be here as well. All of that coming up. But first, this is the Full Court Press. Peter. Just a couple of other stories making news. California, Thousand Oaks, California, beware. There is an albino cobra loose Ugh. in a neighborhood. I saw a picture of Yo. that dude. That, that Stay away from that snake. Let man. me tell you something. There's Cur- a photo. We'll tweet out the photo from uh, mm, our Twitter account. At don't BP step Show. on that snake. It is a. T- it looks like a cobra. And it, it is, is a cobra. Well, it is a cobra. I mean, it's got the whole <laughs> yeah, winged hood. neck whole, yeah. thing, but it's p- totally white. Ugh. The cobra attacked a dog earlier this week. The dog is okay. He survived. The dog's name is Tico. But the owner was able to take a picture of this horrifying creature from hell that is on the loose. They've called in snake wranglers. They've got L.A. County animal control officers. They admitted it's going to be very, Don't very hard to find. They'll never find that snake. No, uh, but you know, cobras are bad enough. Albino cobras are yeah. really mean. <laughs> are they? Are they? Are they, are they are. <laughs> yeah, that's a fact, huh? <laughs> because they're pissed off at being white. Yeah. <laughs> so much for white privilege. Uh, right. Well, that's a perfect segue, by the way, because in Plymouth, Massachusetts, two women Another were, white ki- cobra? were, take, were <laughs> kayaking, oh. taking pictures of seals when their kayak was attacked and overturned by a great white shark. See? Also pissed also off of being pissed white. Also pissed off of being white. <laughs> right, yeah. there you go. <laughs> the women are fine. They were here. able to swim to safety, but they did say they believe it was a great white shark. They have begun looking to see if they could find the shark in the waters of Plymouth, Massachusetts. Yeah, it's great. I'm living in California, Marin uh, County, there are a lot of great whites out there. That's where that's a nursery for the West Coast. Yeah. And they're ver- they're like blind almost. They have very poor eyesight, and they often they mistake surfers for seals. Sure, yeah, yeah. And so maybe they thought this was a big <laughs> seal. <laughs> this is a big seal, man. And while we're sticking with the whole animal theme, we go to Portland, where a three-year-old Great Dane was miserable. He was in pain. He was getting sick. So the owners were freaked out. They rushed him to an emergency animal hospital. They took X-rays. And performed uh, surgery and found out that this Great Dane had eaten 43 and a half socks. What? Oh, no. They pulled all of the socks <laughs> out of the Great Dane. The dog is fine. The dog is okay. But 43 and a half socks this Great Dane was able to fit. And a half. And a half. That's the important part. I want to know what the other half of that sock is. <laughs> but here's what <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I want to know. Didn't the owner just notice something right, was all missing? All of this exact, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't have 43 pair of socks. No! <laughs> no! I mean, look, we all lose a sock oh, in the right. wash, but, like, let's, come on. Yeah. 43 and a half socks. Well, well the big news is the Great Dane is fine. Great Dane is okay. Mm-hmm. Not so. sure what he's eating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what the owner's wearing for socks. <laughs> Yeah. A lot of sandals in that I, house. I, I hope he's not eating the, <laughs> the recover or wearing the recovered socks. Yeah, right. Hmm. All right. Hey, I don't know. I don't know the segue to that, but there is no segue to that. We'll just say thank you and uh, yeah. and move right on. It was last Friday. Um, I forget exactly where I was, but with some friends, and suddenly, you know, my my uh, cell phone kind of went off. I had a little alert, and I checked, and and Mitch McConnell's campaign manager resigns. This is kind of big news. And I said to her, I said, oh my God, look at this. And uh, and then I thought, this, my second thought was, here we are. This is Friday, like around five o'clock. The dump. An- another Friday news dump. It happens more often than you think. Shane Goldmacher from the National Journal, covers Congress for the National Journal, joins us on our news line. He's been writing about this lately. Uh, hi, Shane. Good morning. Good to have you with us. Good morning. How are you? So this is a pattern, isn't it? When you got... <laughs> You got bad news that you want to get out there, but you don't want to get too much attention. You wait until uh, late on Friday afternoon. Happens all the time? 
there's a, there's a long tradition of doing this, and uh, this summer politicians have been up to it more than even usual. <laughs> and so over the, over the weekend, the college and I decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go excavate all the bad news they tried to bury, and we'll we'll bring it back up to light. And so yeah, uh, Mitch McConnell, his campaign manager, was doing that. It was number one on our list, but we came up with a whole bunch of these things. Um, then, you know, the news that people tried to leak out at 6 o'clock, which is when the Benton news broke, uh, 5 o'clock sometime as uh, people head home for the weekend. Uh, so hoping that, you know, they don't see it in the Saturday paper, that they don't read, they're not watching the news Friday night. Right. And by Monday, the news cycle's moved on. And they hope that but reporters, most of whom have filed all their stories right for the time, have kind of wrapped things up and uh, and uh, met their deadlines and, and moved on, Right. Then are maybe yeah. not going to notice it, but the, so the gist of the Benton thing was, uh, what kind of trouble was was uh, Benton in? This Jesse Benton, the campaign manager for Mitch McConnell. Yeah, Jesse Benton's McConnell's campaign manager, and the trouble doesn't relate to his job with McConnell. It related he was the campaign manager for Ron Paul back in 2012, uh, and in Iowa there was a state senator there named Ken Sorensen who basically uh, was accused back in the day, of taking money to endorse Ron Paul and switch allegiance from Michelle Bachman. Michelle Bachman said, oh, he must have been bought off. <laughs> uh, and that got no attention, because, you no, know, that's not true. And it turns out she was right. Uh, he actually uh, said this week, the last week, rather, uh, that he'd accepted money in order to switch allegiances uh, So as a bribe. And uh, that's not allowed. So the question is, did Jesse Benton, Ron Paul's campaign manager, know and the answer so far, we don't know whether he knew or not. But just for Mitch McConnell, who's got a steady lead in the polls and who doesn't want to get entangled in these kinds of questions, said, you know what, it's time for him to go. So Benton offered his resignation. Uh, and, again, that's the kind of news that you control when it gets out there. You right. got him doing this, so 6 o'clock on Friday evening of a Labor Day weekend where everybody's gone, like I, like you, was not in the office any longer. Uh, that's when you let that information out and sure. hope it's gone. And by Tuesday morning, nobody pays attention. Isn't Jesse Benton the one who said uh, sometime back that he held his nose uh, working for Mitch McConnell? Yeah, this is definitely uh, a marriage of political convenience for both of them. Uh, you know, uh, Jesse was Ron Paul's campaign manager. He's very close with Senator Rand Paul, and he was seen as a, a vital link for McConnell to avoid a challenge from the right in the primary. And mm -hmm. while McConnell did have a challenge, he beat him pretty handily. And Benton was an important part of that, helping sort of corral the right for McConnell. Now, again, we're well past the primary, and so the chief purpose for Benton's hiring, uh, you know, had passed. Uh, but, yeah, there, there was never a sort of belief among political insiders that Jesse Benton and Mitch McConnell were very close, but that this was, for McConnell, hiring somebody who was affiliated with the Tea Party. And for the Tea Party and for Rand Paul in 2016, having connections to Mitch McConnell, which can prove valuable in the GOP establishment. Right. Shane Goldmarker with us from the National Journal, nationaljournal.com. Give us examples, of, uh, a couple of examples of uh, late breaking news on a Friday night that people tried to bury by waiting until then to release it, Shane. Yeah, the White House is one of the most aggressive at doing these. So oh, yeah, absolutely. A couple of things they did, uh, Eric Shinseki, the veterans, the fair secretary resigning, that happened on a Friday. My <laughs> personal favorite on this list, because it is a, a significant thing and really was a successful burial, is that the administration is not going to be verifying what income consumers report when they're signing up for Obamacare in the first year. Uh, and so there's a possibility that people put fake incomes on there and get more subsidies than they're allowed. Uh, but they announced that a part of it for the first year, given the sort of enormity of the law, they weren't going to be verifying those income. That happened on July 4th, so not just a Friday, but a <laughs> holiday Friday. Uh, and then, so, you know, there, there's the personal news as well, yeah, things that you can control the timing of. Uh, Congressman Bill Cassidy is running for Senate in Louisiana, one of the, the most closely watched races in the country. Uh, there's a lot of social conservatives in that part of the country. And uh, so he announced, uh, again, uh, the day before July 4th, uh, it was a Thursday, but same, same deal when you're talking about a three-day holiday. Sure. Uh, that his 17-year-old daughter was pregnant. Uh, he chose that time just as the business hours closed to announce the joyous addition to his family. Oh, a joyous addition to his family? Is that yeah. what he called it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 the list is long. And one other favorite, last week, this last week, I don't know if you remember the uh, Senate candidate Richard Murdoch from 2012 in Indiana, 
right. the guy who knocked off Dick Luger in the primary but lost in the general election. He announced that he was resigning his office as Indiana State Treasurer early. Uh, and as some of the local papers pointed out, uh, that might just have something to do with a law that goes into effect this week that cuts state retirement benefits for public officials uh, who are still in office. So he resigned early, a fiscal conservative, left early perhaps to make sure his retirement package remains uh, uh, more sizable. God, it is amazing. It's amazing how, how they do this. Uh, but I see it all the time at the White House. Uh, you know, we'll have the briefing. You know, we leave. Uh, the briefing's usually over by, you know, by 2 o'clock, right. let's say, 2.30. We leave, and then about 4.30 or 5 o'clock, <laughs> there's some announcement comes out, of, comes out of the White House. And it's always, it's, it's, it's always something that they'd rather not get a lot of attention. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's the way they do it. Hey, uh, Shane, before I let you go, I've got to ask you on a totally, this is good stuff, thank you, on a totally different related issue, though. Uh, a lot of voices now in Congress urging the president to um, go forward with airstrikes against uh, ISIS positions in Syria. Uh, is this likely, it, or let me put this, is, is, is Obama likely to ask permission for Congress to do this, or does Congress feel that he needs their permission to do it, or will there, will there be a big debate? What, or how do you see it? Well, Congress certainly feels like he needs, uh, he needs their permission at this point, and it's an interesting coalition that's saying that, you have John McCain, the mo- mo- one of the more hawkish members, saying Congress needs to provide this, and he wants, again, uh, mm-hmm. a-, a broader mandate for the president. And then you've got some of the most dovish members, Barbara Lee, who's the one Democrat, or the one member to vote against the authorization of force in Afghanistan uh, 14 years ago. You know, she wants to vote, and Rand Paul wants to vote. And those folks want votes because they think it won't pass, and that it will basically prevent the United States from getting entangled further in that part of the region. Um, and so there's a lot of calls for vote. People said they're going to do it. Frankly, Congress isn't here that long before November, and just mm-hmm. a couple months before uh, elections, they don't really want to get entangled in a long debate about these things. Uh, Adam Smith had a, 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 was a top Democrat on the uh, House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, or Armed Services Committee, excuse me, uh, You know, had a, a bout of honesty last week when he told uh, the New York Times that there's no way on earth that members are going to come together on a Syria resolution. Uh, it's just not going to happen, he said. Uh, it looks like they're going to have a debate about it. They're going to try. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, don't forget it was just a year ago that the president said, hey, he wanted right. to talk to Congress about Syria. Congress hemmed and hawed, and, you know, they didn't do anything, and God yep. uh, didn't provide any authorization to him. Yeah, didn't do it then, and they may not do it now. Okay, Shane Shane Goldmacher, so, much, uh, so good to have you with us today. Thanks so much. Thanks for your good work, and thanks for your time this morning. Thank you. Talk to you again soon. Uh, National Journal, nationaljournal.com. This is The Bill Press Show. Tune into Free Speech TV for Democracy Now!, a national, independent, award-winning news program bringing you people and perspectives rarely seen on corporate media. Grunt work. (laughs) Love it, hate it, useful, not useful. Necessary. Our social entrepreneurs are people who have been on the front lines of social change. I've learned so much from talking with them. This is Cafe Impact, and I'm Jonathan Lewis. I will say that I think is a challenge for anyone, especially um, the new workforce as they come in, is the ability to accept grant work with grace. The most boring, awful details are the most important elements of doing this work, from the way you save names in your Rolodex to the way you bank and you deposit checks. The truth is this work isn't glamorous, it's rewarding. You don't go into this for the glamour, you go into it for the for the impact. And so it takes that determination to do the scut work to actually get anywhere. It can be really challenging in a first job for someone who's coming out of finishing school to have the enthusiasm that they do to make the type of social impact that they've dreamed of. And now they're here in this first job and all of a sudden they're shouldered with all this grunt work. And they don't understand and they don't get it. And they're resentful. Talk more about the power of answering phones. (laughs) I sure, I I did that myself, you know, took out the trash, cleaned offices when I had to, and it's all good. 
there's power in, in being a good team player and in, in being somebody who sometimes has to support other people's leadership before you get to have your own moment in the sun. Is it hard to wait? It, it is absolutely hard to wait, especially if you're an alpha female like I am. <laughs> I think grunt work can help a new employee build trust internally and, and teach them the nuances of how an organization is run so that they can have a real good sense of what HR is doing, what finance is doing, what all the other departments are, and that actually makes them a better employee in the long run. So in my role on a daily basis, I literally can be looking at a new venture in software. Mm -hmm. um, we could be looking at a microfinance deal. I could be making coffee, taking out the trash, and riding a tractor on any given day. Have you found people who thought it was demeaning that they were given this job, work in the front office and make the coffee when they graduated with all A's from this great university? And, yeah, uh, people like that just don't last very long in our world. If your approach to life is that, you know, you're so smart and you're such a fabulous entrepreneur that you can't understand why people aren't giving you opportunities, it's really hard to advance. Tune in to Gay USA with hosts Ann Northrup and Andy Hum for in-depth coverage of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender news. Watch Gay USA every week only on Free Speech TV. What the frack? What the frack? What the frack? President Obama, are you fracking kidding me? Reopen the EPA studies. In Texas, Wyoming, and Pennsylvania. Fracking pollutes our oceans. Fracking poisons our water. Fracking makes climate change worse. Fracking relies on toxic chemicals that cause cancer. Ban fracking now. Ban fracking now. Go on, ban it. Ban, ban fracking now. now. Please. This is the Bill Press Show. 27 minutes after the hour, Rebecca Cinderbrand uh, from Washington Post in studio with us for the next half hour. CVS made it official yesterday, yesterday, the first day uh, that they have dropped sales of all tobacco products. Good for them. They announced they were going to do this um, six months, a year ago, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but yesterday was the first day of the new regime, if you will, tobacco-free regime. Uh, they are also changing their corporate name to reflect this new direction to CVS Health. Uh, and their retail stores are still going to be called CVS Pharmacy. They're yeah. the second largest uh, pharmacy chain, drugstore chain in the country after uh, Walgreens. We've got one right across the street where I'm there at least two or three times a week it sure, seems, yeah. pick up stuff yeah but this is a big move it's a huge deal it's a big blow to good for them tobacco companies tobacco uh, manufacturers are not happy sure they, they, they think that the people should still have a choice of buying this product or not well they can buy it they can buy it somewhere else yeah yeah, yeah. look you go to the you go to uh, CVS and drug stores for a lot of things usually health related they they see that they want to be a healthcare company now pharmacies drugstores yeah. should be health related hello yeah, that's not stuff that will kill you right exactly you don't go in there to buy stuff that will make you unhealthy or right. that will kill you right. no so good for cvs hope other drugstores follow their lead this is the bill press show When I started learning about nutrition, about which, by the way, much less is known than you might think, I learned that what mattered most about one's health was not necessarily the nutrients, good or bad, that you were consuming or, or staying away from, or even the calorie counts, but what, what, what predicted a healthy diet more than anything else is the fact that it was being cooked by a human being and not a corporation. Corporations cook very differently than people do. 
They use vast amounts of salt, fat, and sugar, much more than you would ever use in your own cooking. And the reason they do that is those are three incredibly attractive and incredibly cheap ingredients. And when they're layered properly, as in a, a chip or um, pastries and forms of junk food, they're incredibly addictive. They, they really press our buttons. They activate our dopamine network, our, our cravings. And in fact, people in the industry, they don't, they don't talk about addiction uh, in the food industry, even though they traffic in addiction. They talk about craveability. It's the same thing. Um, and snackability is another term they use. It's a lovely word. And then the last point about corporate cooking that's important to understand is they cook different stuff than you do at home. Um, what they're good at, in general, they don't cook that well, um, but things like chips, they cook incredibly well. And here's a classic food that if you make it yourself, if you've ever made french fries, you have to wash the potatoes, you have to peel the potatoes, you have to slice the potatoes, you have to fry them in a lot of oil, you have to spatter your entire stovetop, you have to clean up, and then you have this pot of oil you have to get rid of. I mean, it's really difficult, and it's a pain. They're wonderful, but it's a pain. And if you make them yourself, you'll only eat them every six weeks, two months, because it's too much work. But when you let corporations cook for you, it's so simple and so inexpensive, and they're really good, that you will have them twice a day, as many people in America do. So you see the kinds of foods you end up with are these labor-intensive foods and desserts. These special occasion foods become everyday foods when we let industry cook for us. Eat anything you want, just cook it yourself. With justice, we defend the environment in the courtroom. Join our fight. When you take a seat, you take a stand. Earth justice, because the earth needs a good lawyer. You wouldn't let money just blow out of your house. So when your AC or heater is on, make sure the doors, windows, and fireplace flue are shut tight. If you're headed out, turn down the AC or lower the heat by 10 degrees. And always keep your water heater set at 120. A little bit of common sense goes a long way. Get more great tips at energysaver.gov. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Connect with The Bill Press Show on Twitter. Follow us at BP Show and tweet using the hashtag WatchingBP. This is The Bill Press Show. All right, 33 minutes after the hour, Thursday, September 4, The Bill Press Show, brought to you today by the Laborers International Union of North America. Indeed, they're the good men and women of the Laborers Union. Under President Terry O'Sullivan, Building a Better America, and that's their website, Layuna, L-I-U-N-A, LayunaBuildsAmerica.org. Check it out. We salute them all and thank them for their support. Uh, some very interesting things happening on the political front, and uh, we have brought in, or she has agreed to come in and tell us all about it, uh, from the Washington Post, political editor... Rebecca Cinderbrand. Oh, Rebecca, nice to see you. Nice to see you. And congratulations on this new hat you're wearing for the Washington Post. It's good to be there. I know. Climbing the corporate ladder. <laughs> <laughs> the next... Uh, next uh, Falling my uh, way to the middle. The next publisher, yeah. is it? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. So 
There's a new phenomenon, it seems, here. It's a trend. Can we call I, it a trend after two? I think we can. I think we can call it in a trend. In one week, yeah. In one week, in one week, we have seen two Democratic candidates for statewide office drop out and support an independent in order to try to beat the Republican. That's right. right? Although, although, to be fair, in this latest instance, we haven't yet heard from the Democrat okay. who dropped out. We haven't heard. But well, clearly, we'll just, that's the import of the action. That's, that's, it, that's, that's the that's import of the action, here. and we will uh, assert that that's why. Right. Okay. So we're talking Kansas, which is very significant because the control of the United States Senate, every single Senate seat counts. And this is one, Kansas, where Pat Roberts, longtime incumbent senator, right, Republicans need to hold on to that well, And, seat. of course, the irony, uh, if we go back a little bit here, is the last time Kansas sent a Democrat to the Senate, 1930s. So we're talking a really mm. long time here. Well, I was just trying to think back as I, if I could remember one. I, you know, yeah, yeah, so it's, it's, been, it's been a while. So yeah, been I would a say, a while. say and, and so. Yeah. And so um, but, you know, Democrats had reason to think Pat Roberts is vulnerable. First, I mean, you know, you go back, he's had, he, there's been a number of issues, right? So um, Brownback has not been the most popular of governors in Kansas. There's not a great environment. There's and Brownback may lose running for re-election, he's, correct? He's, he's, he's a bit vulnerable there himself. Yeah. Um, but then you also have, you know, Roberts has been plagued by this residency question, which, of course, is a proxy for, is this guy out of touch? Um, and then, then you had during the primary running against Barack Obama's distant, 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 distant Tea Party cousin. Mm -hmm. um, he actually, you know, the, the Tea Party candidate Milton Wolf managed to rack up a pretty decent chunk of the vote for, you know, a, a woefully underfunded candidate against a, a solid incumbent. Um, Pat Robertson really has sort of a Thad Cochran problem in that yeah, he's just been around exactly. too long. I think that's what huh? we'll call it from now on is the, Thad, the Cochran Thad Cochran problem. problem. And then you know, it's just older and I mean, people just say out of touch, living here most of the time, and, and uh, he probably should not have run again. Right. But well, and now he's facing this race. And so you had this string of polls, this really interesting string of polls, first of all, that showed him very soft in support with mm -hmm. uh, approval ratings that were down in the 30s in some polls in the 20s. I mean, just woefully low ratings. And then you had this one interesting number in the PPP poll a couple weeks ago, which showed if there was a head-to-head -head race, the independent candidate would beat him. And uh, that was a Greg, number that made a lot Greg, of Democrats their, their, their ears Orman, perk up. Greg, Greg Orman, Orman independent the candidate. The independent candidate. Now, he's a guy, he's an interesting guy. He's been a Republican. He's been a Democrat. Um, he refuses to say which party he'd caucus with. He says that, it, you know, he'd go with whichever party's in the majority. And if it was up to him to decide the majority, well, he'd just hear them out, see what they have to say. You know, this is a great position to be in if you're... If I was just going to say, wouldn't you love to be in that position? Right. right. Yeah. He, the control of the United States. So. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I'll take it under advisement. But, you know, he's a guy who could self-fund the campaign. He's got a chunk of change. And he brought in far, far more money. And, and in the opinion of a lot of Democrats, run a better campaign than the Democratic candidate. Chad Taylor. Chad Taylor. Chad Taylor. That's right. amazing. So what Chad Taylor story. has dropped out. Chad Taylor has the left news the of the building. day is Chad, Chad Taylor is out. And that was the deadline was now, coming up. Was okay. coming up and has so, he endorsed Greg Orman? Um, so far, um, it, you know, last we had reached out, it's been radio silence for Mr. Taylor. But, um, you know, Democratic mm -hmm. officials in the state, uh, you know, the, the this is, is really kind of a best case scenario. Look, Taylor was not going to beat Pat Roberts. Right. That's not going to happen, particularly in a three way race against a better he funded not independent meet, candidate. He was probably not going to beat Greg Orman. He was not either. going to be a United States Senator. He was not he, headed for He was going to be, he was in third place. That's really? right. Yeah. Right. And so he's dropped out. Uh, so now the question is will he endorse, but also the bigger question will Democrats? rally behind the independent and whether or not that's something that actually helps a candidate in a state like kansas look already you're hearing from um you know republicans immediately jumping on this saying look he's being you know directed it's a conspiracy democrats in washington are pulling the strings here and, and he's doing everything he can to distance himself they're already saying you know orman equals obama it's the same <laughs> you know, it's the, oh and, yeah, yeah right. um and, and so you know it, it, i think he'd like to get as much distance between himself and all things democratic at least between now and election day but he also wants their votes and he, he, needs he would their, very much like their votes and yes. he needs their votes he desperately needs their votes right 
It's the only way that Democrats could possibly topple Pat Roberts, which is the number one goal here, right? Right. I mean, it's Kansas. interesting. It's you know, fascinating. The, the it really is. Matt, but, is. But, you know, it also, to me, it shows, I, 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 let's just assume that this is the way, this is why Chad Taylor did it at the urging of some Democratic well, Party bosses, we maybe. We do know said, that he had a conversation that uh, Claire McCaskill had reached out to him, we do know from Democratic sources, oh. um, had spoken to him, and, and said, whatever the, whatever was the content of that conversation. Hey, dude, you know you can't win. Let's do the right thing here, right? Fall, we're, we're, we're fall on here, your but yeah, Right, fall on your sword. But if, if, that's, if, if, if that is, in fact, the case, I have to salute the Democrats for a very pragmatic solution to otherwise an unwinnable race. Yeah. I mean, it may not work, right? Well, but I if, this is, why, if this is why they did it, I think it's pretty damn smart. Well, it yeah. had the overwhelming support of the state party. The over, I mean, the state party took a vote on this also. Oh. And, and so, and, and in, I mean, sorry, in Alaska, the state party took a vote on oh, this. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you're having this feeling among Democrats. Look, whatever it takes... Yeah. Right. However, we can get okay. these guys out. You All right. Know, well, now I want to talk about Alaska because we say this is a trend. Yeah. So we've talked about what happened in yeah. Kansas because this is the latest news. But a, a few days ago, yes. the, the, this this week, the same thing happened uh, similarly, and in, in the governor's race in Alaska, and they're on the same ticket. Where the so the Democratic <laughs> candidate for governor is now is now the independent candidate. For well, lieutenant governor. So he has joined the ticket right. with the incumbent candidate for governor. I well, mean, would, uh, not, not incumbent. With the independent, independent, candidate, independent for governor. candidate for yeah. governor. Because he knew he couldn't beat him again. He, no. <laughs> yeah. So you have three candidates again. Follow this, right? <laughs> the Republican, the independent, the Democrats in third place. Right. So the Democrat drops out of running for governor endorses the independent candidate for governor and is running as his vice I'm, I'm not fine. Uh, yeah, lieutenant as his governor running mate. As his running mate. As his running mate. Right. And again, the, the overwhelming support. This it, is, I mean, it's, it's. I never remember hearing anything like this before. I mean, it's It's. It's, it's a wild. trend. It's, it's, it's a, a new trend. trend, yeah. But again, if in fact the Democrats sort of coalesce and said, hey, you know, we're not going to beat this dude ourselves. We'd rather have the independent than the yeah. Republican. Let's be smart. I mean, it's... I mean, it's, you know, it's it's still, and uh, yeah, pull they're not, you know, they're not necessarily in the driver's seat when it comes to kind of taking out panel, but this gives them a, a decent shot or certainly a better shot than they had before. And then you also have Mark Baggage, even with the kind of, you know, the, the, the troubles he's had this week with that controversial ad and so on. He's still in a much stronger position than people thought. And so Every, you have absolutely. you have this situation where we are in, you know, a strong year for Republicans. We're in Alaska. And yet. The Republicans are not exactly sitting easy up there. Mm-hmm. I wonder. Is no, this and, re- and Alaska is con- is a Republican state. Yeah. you know, it's a red state, yeah. so it could be. It, it, it's interesting. Tur- it's, an, it's an interesting. Uh, the big question is, what does Sarah Palin think That's about? That's right. It? Who's I she mean, endorsing uh, this whole thing? Yeah, Alaska. that will decide the whole thing, right? Is this sort of a case by case thing, or is this sort of could this give way to the whole third party candidate idea? Or is this just sort of they see this? I happening think it's like in every. It, it, it's this kind of individual thing, but but it's in enough states where, mm-hmm. you know, one of the interesting things, and this is by no means in the same category as these other two states, but you know, when you look at what's happening in New York right now with the governor's race, mm-hmm. where you have you know this groundswell of support for Tim Wu to the extent that there's stories being floated out there that, you know, Cuomo should drop his running mate or is getting pressure to drop his running mate and, and take on Tim Wu because people will have to, you know, that the, the weird system they have up in New York or the different system, the special system with all those um, uh, uh, separate minor party lines. Um, mm-hmm. It's an interesting situation where these independent candidates can build enough of a base of support um, they can get the parties to take notice. Yeah. So, Kansas and Alaska, uh, is this, in fact, a trend? Are we going to see more of this? And could this be the answer in the case of Kansas, maybe to uh, uh, to prevent Republicans from taking over control of, of the Senate? Every one of those seats count. Every single one of them counts. Rebecca Sindoran here with us. She does follows all of this. This is her job for the Washington Post, political editor. We'll be right back. Uh You know, you happen to be in Kansas or Alaska, I'd love to hear from you, or anywhere else, at 866-55-PRESS. This is The Bill Press Show.
issue on this planet right now is to protect and conserve biodiversity in, in the world's oceans. And I don't think people realize just how intimate our connection is with the oceans themselves. Not only do they provide the very foundation of life and control our weather, but uh, life just simply could not exist without a healthy ocean. The real problem, though, is apathy. It's all out of sight. It's all out of mind, and people don't even think about it. But it doesn't matter whether you live in Peoria or on the coast. The fact is, whatever happens in the ocean affects all, all life forms on the planet Earth. If the oceans die, then civilization collapses. We all die. We cannot live on this planet without the oceans. This is, in fact, not the planet Earth. It's the planet ocean. But because we're a land-dwelling species, we refer to it as Earth. But it is the planet ocean, and the oceans are the heart and the foundation of all life on the planet. Two anti-government, self-described revolutionaries have shot up a pizza restaurant as well as a Walmart in Las Vegas. The internationally syndicated political series, The David Pacman Show, provides progressive talk, analysis, and interviews with the nation's youngest radio and television host, David Pacman. Find out more and catch up on all the latest episodes by visiting our website at freespeech.org. At Earth Justice, we defend the environment in the courtroom. Join our fight. When you take a seat, you take a stand. Earth Justice, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. Tune into Gay USA with hosts Ann Northrup and Andy Hum for in depth coverage of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender news. Watch Gay USA every week only on Free Speech TV. Seen on Free Speech TV and online on Talker TV, this is The Bill Press Show. 13 minutes before the top of the hour, rolling into hour number three soon with Peter Fenn, Democratic strategist here for the entire hour, as a friend of Bill, and uh, Mary Kay Henry, head, uh, president of the SEIU, Service Employees International Union, of course, and the driving force behind today's na nationwide fast food strike will be here as well. Rebecca Cinderbrand is the political news editor for the Washington Post here in the studio with us. And, of course, um, Labor Day is now behind us, and so we're really into the midterm elections, um, which has been consuming members of Congress and the United States Senate uh, for the last couple of years, I guess. But... Uh, they are taking a little time out from their election election days to come back here for to Washington uh, for maybe some governing. A legislating break. <laughs> a legislating break, right. Although we don't expect them to get too much done, uh, Rebecca, but Syria will definitely be high on the agenda Absolutely. when they come back. Uh, Syria airstrikes in Syria. Um, okay. A year ago, they were asked to authorize, air, by the president, authorize airstrikes in Syria. What's the difference between then and now? It's like, what a difference a year makes. Huh? I mean, you know, it's it's interesting because now you have 
very vocal members of Congress saying, you know, criticizing the president for not taking enough action. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's good. It, it, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Essentially. But, you know, you know, and you do have a couple people saying, you know, Tim Kaine and others have been vocal about saying the president has to come to Congress um, to get this kind of authorization. And, you know, They've yet to say whether or not, wh- how exactly that they would approach that. You know, up till now, the president's position has been that he will consult with Congress on military action, but that he doesn't necessarily need authorization. We'll see how this yeah. changes. Yeah, um, they, they've been asserting at, at our White, White House briefings, we are we are convinced, I've heard the president, the president has told us this, we're convinced, we've got the authority. That's right. But we want Congress involved, right? right. So it sounds like they'll say they won't do it without asking Congress. Or without, or without consulting Congress, consult. which is, you know, well, they, they, it's two very different things to say, like, you know, we're going to loop Congress in, we're going to make sure Congress is aware and briefed, and That's which is something right. that hasn't always happened with this White House, yeah. um, as opposed to saying, we want the permission. But then you've Congress. got uh, people from a Rand Paul to a Barbara Lee who are saying, no, we need to debate this and, <laughs> and authorize, you know, actually vote on it, whether or not the president... Whether, whether or not there will be strikes or not. Or right. And, you know, just to pause for a moment here, one of the interesting dynamics that we're seeing is, you know, the Republican Party right now seems to be kind of forgetting its kind of, you know, isolationist moment. There was a moment there, you know, it, not that long ago after the Bush presidency when it seemed as though a lot of candidates were, were, were pulling back a bit, maybe saying let's not get so involved, and, and they seem to kind of be reverting to old patterns. Even people who, you know, we seem thought had kind of, you know, more libertarian-ish, maybe more isolationist leanings are saying, hey, it may, maybe it's time to, to get a bit more active on that front. Right. That's a headline on the Washington Post, the front page That's this morning. Right. Islamic State prompts GOP to strike a more hawkish tone. Uh, is part of that because they want to come back to the old uh, Republican argument against Democrats, Democrats weak on defense? It's certainly an argument you're hearing. Um, you know, it's it's it doesn't necessarily have to be that argument. There are other arguments that they could make, but this seems to be the reflexive one, the one that's drawing the greatest response. Ted Cruz, when he was speaking at the AFP conference a couple of days ago, that you know his critique of the Obama presidency on that front drew the biggest response from the crowd there, um, the Tea Party crowd there. Obama so. back to the Stone Age, right? And that's a Tea Party crowd. Right. Oh, y- yeah. Right. So, so people who might be inclined to say, "Let's not get so involved," mm. no. They, they, they want to see some action. They want to see a mu- they want to see a more muscular foreign policy. It, it's a Tea Party crowd, but it's an anti-Obama crowd too. I Both mean, of you the, know, right. the, when you when you add those it's together, it's almost a perfect uh, the Venn diagram is an almost perfect <laughs> intersection of those two. Yeah. Uh, right. Um, overall, what is the feeling about um, the midterm elections in terms of control of the Senate, which is the number one issue? Which, which, I mean, this is the if you interest- read some people, they say, look, it's it's obviously Republican year. The economy is still not as robust as it should be. We got all these foreign policy tangles. And so right. it's a Republican year. Republicans are going to get control of the Senate. It's, you know, the, the, we've had. I don't see it that way necessarily. We've had this conversation. You know, it's, it's a race by race. You know, we don't have a national referendum. We have race by race. And when you look at each of these Good races point. on a granular right. level, it, it very much depends. You know, there are some, everyone has their own little calculator, each news organization, where they kind of come up with this percentage to say who's going to have control of the Senate. And and overwhelmingly, most of them say, look, the odds are in the Republicans' favor heavily. What's interesting is our own odds makers here, you know, at the Washington Post, it's actually much closer in their calculation. And, you know, again, they're looking at race by race by race, the different dynamics in each individual which race. Is, which and they is have what it far you closer. have to do. It's the look, only it's the only way to go. Now, let's be honest, the fundamentals, the fundamentals in terms of who's got the most motivated voters and, and, and so on, those f- and, and the historical trends, those favor the Republicans. Um, but there are areas, races, we, we, you know, we've seen in Arkansas, Mark Pryor running generally a smart campaign. We've seen, you know, until this week, we had a little bit of a hiccup, but Mark Baggage up in Alaska running a... Yeah. Yeah, right, right, hiccup, running, running, a, running, a, running a pretty smart campaign up there as well. And so you're seeing these individual embattled Democrats figuring out how they need to run and in And Kay Hagan states. in North Carolina really yeah. holding on, running a brilliant campaign down there and did very well in our first debate, uh, maybe the only debate in that race. So, uh, so it ain't over yet. Well, we'll, we'll, a, we'll see. We'll what a great see. job you've got, Rebecca Sinner. I'm glad you are where you are. Political news editor, Washington Post. WashingtonPost.com, of course, and uh, 
good of you to take time out to come in and see us. Thanks for having me. All right, thanks. I will go right back. Tell you what, the president is up to in Wales today. No golf on the agenda. (laughs) This is the Bill Press Show. Hey, what a great two hours so far, but a really big third hour coming up. You're not going to want to miss this. Peter Fenn, a leading Democratic strategist, will be here for the entire hour as a friend of Bill. And then we will be joined by Mary Kay Henry, one of our great labor leaders in this country, the president of the SEIU and the force behind today's fast food strikes in more than a dozen cities around fast strikes of fast food workers in more than a dozen cities around the country so stay tuned for our number three on talker tv youtube.com slash talker t-a-w-k-r tv Tune into Free Speech TV for Democracy Now!, a national, independent, award-winning news program bringing you people and perspectives rarely seen on corporate media. I probably would make a time machine. I would make medicine for the sick. I'd probably invent something new. If I could have an extra five years to live. You said five, right? Five years. It's a long time. I would try to fix everything I did bad. I would bring my uncle back because I miss him very much. I would um, get a, more hamsters. I would probably want to go looking for dark matter. I think I'd go looking for aliens. If I could live an extra five years. I was thinking about making like a A helicopter, like a wooden helicopter, but I don't have any wood. I want to go check out the moon sometime. I'd probably teach my sister not to hate tuna. I would try and invent a machine that lets you you run at light speed. If I had five more extra years to live, I would be the boss of all the chipmunks. Eu cantaria na frente de um milhão de pessoas. I don't really know. I think I'd do anything. Why are you asking me that? show. Here we go in the next hour, exciting hour. Peter Fenn, one of our country's leading Democratic strategists, here in studio with us for the entire hour. Uh, then we will be joined by Mary Kay Ferguson, Mary Kay Henry, sorry, who is the president of the Service Employees International Union, the SEIU, and the uh, main driving force behind the fast food strike today. President Obama, of course, in Wales at the NATO summit. And it's a day of official meetings. They already had one on the Ukraine. There's one on ISIS a little bit later. And then in between uh, lunches, official lunches and working dinners, uh, they take time out for two different family photos at Wales is what it's all about. No golf, as so far as we know, on the president's agenda. This is the Bill Press Show.
West here reporting from Houston, Texas for Climate Desk. Now, one of the biggest uncertainties in climate science right now is the role of clouds. What better way to work that part out than flying right through them? That's what NASA scientists aboard this aeroplane think. Welcome to NASA's biggest airborne laboratory. You're coming with us today on an eight-hour NASA flight mission. When you read these big IPCC climate assessments, what's the biggest uncertainty? There's two, right? The role of aerosols and how and clouds. Clouds is probably bigger than aerosols. And that is a piece of a puzzle that right now we are missing. You can't get the models right if you don't understand the chemistry and the process. Now we're being told we've got to get on. The doors are about to shut, so let's go aboard. turn on the weather, every time you hear a climate change prediction, that information has to come from somewhere. And it starts by getting sucked out of the air from planes like this. So this mission is to particular try to understand the emissions from the surface, so mostly biogenic emissions, so from trees and other plants. Right now we're flying to our very first part of this experiment on the DC-8. Over Arkansas, there's a particularly pungent bouquet of emissions that scientists are interested in measuring. Well, these emissions lead to both aerosols and to molecules that both destroy and create ozone. So these are very important things to understand for climate studies. How it, manif how it will manifest itself, it will be in more accurate and more reliable predictions. So what we're doing is taking a series of flyovers, each at a different level of the atmosphere, scooping up those emissions, testing them, and hopefully scientists are going to see exactly what's in this column of air all the way up. The data that we collect in one flight can keep busy 60 scientists and uh, students for three years, four years. We're still starting data from data collected 20 years ago. In fact, this particular mission today is its most heavily equipped in its nearly 30 years of service. Each one of these consoles here is a specially equipped scientific instrument designed to collect all sorts of different data in real time. And this instrument here tracks the sun. We're looking at mist chambers. They're used to strip soluble gases. This black line is the CO2. It's it's about 390 ppm right now. We're putting these filters in the bags that we've got the aerosols that we trapped out of a certain amount of air. And so we're sampling up here about 150 liters a minute. That ultimately flows back into the operational models. It flows back into what goes on TV every day. Anyway, I gotta get this yes, sample going. You do it. It's a busy man at work. We can't let him rest. Well, get this, we've just spent two hours crisscrossing this one cloud formation in, back out again, back in again. Then they grow, and we track them as long as we can, and then we let it go. Even one cloud can hold a host of answers to the mysteries of climate change. The patterns of, you know, where the clouds are, what type of clouds we see, what kind of weather systems they're associated with, it, that'll all be shifting in a, in a shifting climate, in a, in a world with climate change. And the big spark is this, is when we actually get the meat on the grill and then it will be some time <laughs> to process it. The most important issue on this planet right now is to protect and conserve biodiversity in, in the world's oceans. And I don't think people realize just how intimate our connection is with the oceans themselves. Not only do they provide the very foundation of life and control our weather, but uh, life just simply could not exist without a healthy ocean. The real problem, though, is apathy. 
It's all out of sight, it's all out of mind, and people don't even think about it. But it doesn't matter whether you live in Peoria or on the coast. The fact is, whatever happens in the ocean affects all, all life forms on the planet Earth. If the oceans die, then civilization collapses. We all die. We cannot live on this planet without the oceans. This is, in fact, not the planet Earth. It's the planet ocean. But because we're a land-dwelling species, we refer to it as Earth. But it is the planet ocean, and the oceans are the heart and the foundation of all life on the planet. What the frack? What the frack? What the frack? President Obama, are you fracking kidding me? Reopen the EPA studies. In Texas, Wyoming, and Pennsylvania. Fracking pollutes our oceans. Fracking poisons our water. Fracking makes climate change worse. Fracking relies on toxic chemicals that cause cancer. Ban fracking now. Ban fracking now. Go on. Ban it. Ban, Ban fracking now. now. Please. Broadcasting around the nation, on your radio, on your TV, and online. This is the Bill Press Show. Leaders of 28 NATO nations meeting in Cardiff, Wales. President Obama is there on the agenda. Ukraine and ISIS. No golf, so far as we know. Hello, everybody. What do you say? It is Thursday, September 4. So good to see you. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to the Bill Press Show. We are here in our nation's capital. We're kind of quiet with everybody out of town, but we got it covered. Uh, we'll tell you what's going on here in Washington, D.C., around the country, around the globe. We're reaching out to you on your local progressive talk radio station, of course, nationwide. Good to have you with us. And worldwide on our video stream, Talker TV, youtube.com slash Talker, T-A-W-K-R TV. Uh, what a good day. Made an even better day but one of our good friends, Peter Fenn, uh, Democratic strategist, leading Democratic strategist. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, legendary <laughs> Democratic strategist. Uh, oh, in the studio political with hack. Uh, <laughs> in studio with the entire hour as a, uh, for the entire hour as a friend of Bill. Hello, Peter. Great to see you. Great to be back, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Had a good summer? Very good summer. That's Very nice. nice. That you, you know, we knew once Labor Day was done, then we could reach out to Peter Fenn. <laughs> <laughs> get him off, get him off the, uh, get him off the shore. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sailboat. He's back from the, from the fishing and the sailing and everything else. You join our team here, of course, Peter. Peter Ogburn and Lisa Murphy. You've been on the job every day this summer. Right. Happy right. Thursday. As usual. Yeah. Uh, Alicia Cruz has got the phones covered. And Cyprian Bolding, our videographer, keeping us looking good, as good as we can, as he can give us, given what he's got to work with, put it that way, <laughs> uh, on our video stream. Uh, yeah, how about it? And, you know, um, everybody's got to be so careful, Peter, you know, in, in politics, and you have to Particularly, I find around the White House, they have to couch things so carefully, very cautious, very cautious. Uh, and sometimes you just wish they would just tell it like it is. Well, God bless Joe Biden. So, you know, ISIS, he doesn't pussyfoot around ISIS. Yesterday, he said, here's how far we'll go to track him down. We will follow them to the gates of hell <laughs> until they are brought to justice. Because hell is where they will reside. Hell is where they will reside. <laughs> I think Don't that's it. it. I love Joe Biden. I've always loved Joe Biden. I talk about religious fervor. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. But, you know, I, I think one of the things that uh, uh, would be nice is if uh, Obama channeled a little of the Joe Biden right. sometimes. Thank you. Know? you. Thank you. Uh, everybody, I, I, see, I, everybody, I, I says it, everybody says it's the opposite. You know, if, if only Joe Biden would tone it down and be professorial like the president. No, 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 no. Right, right. We don't need Look, 
uh, you know, we, 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 all, we, we all respect the, the president. We yeah. all think he's got a very cool, calm, deliberative style, that he's a good decision maker, uh, that he weighs things well. But, you know, at this point, you have an American public that, on the one hand, wants some of this fervor. The other thing that they want, Bill, I wrote a little column about this, they want a president who is uplifting, who is upbeat, who is positive, who, you know, who isn't on the defensive all the time. Mm. If you look at the great presidents and and uh, uh, of this country, you know, you look at FDR, what he had to do during that depression and how he did it and how he restored faith and hope mm. to the American dream, as Bill Clinton used to say, or Ronald Reagan. I mean, you know, he could go after Washington, and then he'd talk about the shining city on the hill. Yeah. People want to be inspired. We need more of that from this present especially the next two months before an election <laughs> yeah yeah let me let me get let me throw one other name out there too because i'm just in the middle of doris kearns goodwin's great new book on teddy, teddy roosevelt. roosevelt teddy rose it's sort of it, the parallels between then and now are so striking because then the malefactors of great wealth as he called them right wall street they were ruling everything and teddy took them on and he took them on against all odds and the way he did it he used the bully puppet and he was up and he went around and he got the people behind him yeah. and then he just mowed him down and, 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 and you, you know, know th th yeah. that is the mark of a great leader yeah. and and obama has shown that in the past he can do that he is able and, to and i don't know you know if i were him no offense but instead of playing so many golf games i'd be out there more on this stuff he did it on labor day he was pretty darn good on labor day uh, now joe yeah. biden was a little better yeah. but, <laughs> but but i still think it's that yeah. question of of the American people now are, you look at those poll numbers, they are down in the dumps. The economy is improving. Things are getting so. a little better. They don't feel it. They don't sense mm -hmm. it. They're not talking about it. But this president should say, hey, look, you, you know, he should be the Arthur T, the market basket guy, uh, you know, who, who saved that company, who said to the employees, you know, you guys are doing it. You guys are making this company. You are putting this together. I don't know. I, I just, I, I feel real strongly about it. So really let do. Joe be Joe. Is let our, Joe be Joe. Yeah, I, I love Joe. Yeah, I love Peter that. Fenn here. He's wound up this morning. <laughs> he's got this little, coffee from downstairs. <laughs> I don't know what it is. He's, got, totally little, it. he's got a little Joe Biden pumping in his blood. <laughs> well, so. And we'll be joined by Mary Kay Henry, uh, one of our great labor leaders in this country, head of the SEIU and the driving force between behind today's a nationwide fast food worker strike. We'll find out all about that. Uh, but first... This is the Full Peter, Court Press. Peter, yes, big just headlines of the day. A couple of other stories making news. You know, it is still technically summer, but as we move into uh, fall, you'll be able to find some really great deals on travel. For example, mm -hmm. Market Watch has a story about some cruise lines. If you want to take a trip from uh, Alaska to the Riviera Maya, or maybe from the Northeast U.S. to Florida or to the Caribbean, you can do that for about forty-nine dollars a day. Well, there's one catch. It's a one-way trip. <laughs> Cruise industries are doing what they call repositioning. So they're sending different oh. ships to different ports, and then they don't necessarily come back to the same ports. So you pay extremely low fares and extremely low rates, but you don't come back home on the same ship. You have to fly back home or however you feel like getting back. Or maybe you don't come back at all. That's right. You relax in the Caribbean. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, I think a one-way cruise is probably just plenty. plenty. <laughs> I can send some people on that. Yeah, Mitch, right, that's Mitch McConnell. <laughs> I'll pay for Mitch yeah, McConnell to take it. a one-way cruise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we've all been there when you're playing golf. You want to go play golf by yourself, and then you get put into a foursome with a bunch of people you don't know. That is what happened to one man in, where else, Florida, Palm Beach County. Michael Rich was playing by himself. He got put into a group with three other mm -hmm. guys to make a foursome, and he didn't play very well, and he blamed the other men in the group. Oh. So he did what any sane, level-headed man would do. He attacked them with his putter. He struck two men with his putter. He told them that they were making too much noise. They were throwing him off of his game. And he didn't want to play with them any damn way. So, so he attacked them. The man has been arrested and charged with two counts of aggravated battery. Whoa. So Ooh. he could always be a little bit worse. Serious golfer. Hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's just funny. I never heard of anybody getting struck or striking another player on the golf course. I'm surprised <laughs> it hasn't happened more often. I'm shocked it hasn't more it hasn't happened more often. And you know, Bill, we, you have a hell of a commute here to get to the studio. We're I, I know. About it often. I, it's not quite as bad as Matt Lauer. Matt Lauer, we found out this morning, according to Page Six, that NBC is so determined to keep him as the host of the Today Show, they actually send a helicopter for him every single morning and helicopter him back to his house in the Hamptons. It's part of his deal that he he's signed. He lives full-time in the Hamptons? In, yes, he wow. does. He lives on a horse farm in the Hamptons with his wife and kids. He signed a new contract in June, and part of that contract was helicopter rides to and from work. Every day. Every day. Wow. What must that cost? A private every helicopter city. every single day? Yeah. There and back? <laughs> it's well, not a $49 cruise ride, I'll tell you that. That's $4 <laughs> a gallon gas. That's anyway. right. As much as I appreciate the thought of you know providing a helicopter for my commute... Mm-hmm. Um, you're okay with the walk? I'm okay with the walk. Stop walk. the construction on the helipad on top of the building. We almost, we're least, almost there. I thought they were building some kind of escalator kind of coming up in those houses. <laughs> just, just a conveyor belt from Bill's yeah. front door to the studio. Yeah, I'm okay with walking a block. It's a, <laughs> you know, you're going to handle that? I you need a helicopter? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Peter Fenn, there's so much to talk about. Where do we? I want to start with a story that I saw the other day. I think you might have sent me about a poll for 2016 among lefties, like us, right? Right. right. And uh, the general thought is that we love Hillary Clinton, but she should not have a, a coronation. We would have a healthy primary. Uh, do you agree? And if so, who are some of the possible people who might run from the left. Well, you know, I, I, that was a very interesting uh, poll because basically what it did was it gave uh, it gave Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders uh, almost equal billing. And, and then uh, they said some people volunteered the two of them. And Hillary was down on that list. <laughs> so, you know, I think, you know, w- what we're seeing, I think, uh, from, from Elizabeth Warren is – Keep your powder dry. Uh, be out there. You got a book, so you're yeah, talking about on, your book, uh, Letterman, Letterman last, last night, night. and yeah. she's very feisty, very tough. And she is doing what you just talked about, Bill. She's the Teddy Roosevelt of the time right now. She's mm-hmm. taken on the big banks and yep, and right. Wall Street folks. And you know, you can argue uh, back and forth about whether that's the right approach, but. You know, it certainly energizes that base. And and Bernie is, you know, he's been in Iowa. He's been, he's going to New Hampshire. Uh, he's getting, a, he's well-received from folks. And, you know, can oh, he win vet, this veteran, race? Veterans Administration veterans, thing, he, got, he was right look, out in front of us. And, and, you know, everybody talks pre- about, oh, you know, he's a lefty. He can't get along. He's polarizing. Baloney, he, you know, he put together this compromise. Bipartisan uh, deal. And, President and, and, signed and, and, the bill. It was, yeah. it was a terrific job. So, uh, you know, I, I happen to think, you know, obviously his odds of winning a nomination are, are pretty darn tough. But I think it's healthy. I mean, I think this notion that we have a coronation, I mean, that's the way the Republicans used to do it. I mean, I don't like it. And I think it makes Hillary stronger anyway. And I think, you know, I think what you do with these with these primary challenges is you get yourself toughened up for a general election race. So you don't get, you know, hit hard in September and October in, a, in, in the general. And you, you've dealt with these problems early on. Right. So I, I think it's, you know, I think it's not a, a it'll thing. it'll it'll force her to... To talk about some issues that she wouldn't otherwise talk about, right? You know, right. get in, right. income inequality and uh, these student loans and you right. know, minimum wage, unemployment insurance, all these good issues on the left. Yeah, and uh, you I, know, I, I and I think, look, if it helps move her a little bit. Uh, on some of these issues to the left, it's a healthy thing because otherwise, my sense is she's going to continue to kind of go middle. Certainly on foreign policy stuff, she's 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 trying to uh, I, I, she's it, becoming it, it, the Iron Lady yeah, a little bit, yeah. you know. And that's that's the uh, sense of it with Obama. But so, even more important on the domestic stuff because you know I I really think that we have some cru- crucial problems, just the ones you mentioned, and we've got to get. Out in front of those problems, and we can't we can't dilly dally. Now with it. you mentioned um, uh, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. Uh, both we've talked about them before. Uh, Peter did a story a little bit earlier that apparently Martin O'Malley has now told donors that he is in fact going to run no matter what she does or right. not. 
This is this is good for the party. I, I think it's fine. I mean, I, I, look, uh, O'Malley has no other choice. He's leaving. The, he has to leave the governorship. He has no other office. But he is putting paid staffers. He's raising money for this PAC, putting paid staffers in Iowa and New Hampshire and some of these key states, helping out uh, 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 senators that, that are up. He's he's traveling the country, speaking in the rubber chicken circuit. Um, he maybe get his band up. I mean, he'll be the Bruce Springsteen of, uh, of the, right. of the yeah, field right. there. With band. But, right. you know, uh, and he knows it's a long shot. He knows what he's doing. I think I read seven out of ten Democrats. Don't even know, don't who, even he know who he is. Yeah. Right. Right. Doesn't surprise yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, but, raising but, money will not be easy for Martin yeah. O'Malley, no offense. But, but it's a good move. I think it's a good him. move on his part. Sure. Yeah. And, and he's a good man. Good, and, and it's been a good governor. Here's the other wi- wild card out there. Uh, and I don't, I'm, not, he's not, I'm not a big fan. But uh, Jim Webb, former Senator Jim Webb, one term senator, quit. Yeah. And now he's running around, and he's, again, he's uh, under the auspices of a book. Yeah. But, you know, uh, I, I, I was listening to him on the Diane. Reem show uh, a few weeks ago, and clearly he had a bunch of callers calling <laughs> and telling him oh. he should run for president of the United oh, States. Yeah. Yeah. I, thought, oh, come know, on. I don't I think, think he's you, going to, I, no, no, I think you said it all. I used to be a big fan of his. Right. I think you said a one term center quit. Yeah. Uh, you know, come on. He's, kind of the, he's the Sarah Palin of our party. Yeah, yeah. Right. No. What, what's That's a little deal? too harsh. That's right. a little too harsh. Uh, no, but I think in fairness <laughs> now, we have, to, we have to get, come back to. <laughs> A uh, uh, person we started talking about, Joe Biden. Right. I mean, right. he's got to be in the mix too, right? I mean, yeah. I don't think he runs if Hillary does, but right. But I'd love to see Biden. I, I, I love think. To see him. I think Biden, uh, both in terms of his profile, where he's going, and what he's saying, is positioning himself in case there's the, the Hillary uh, decides not to go. And you know, the advantage he has and disadvantage is that he has high name recognition obviously. He has a cadre of supporters. He has a very tight and good political operation. He has a lot of folks around him who I have a good deal of respect for. And it's tighter than the Hillary uh, uh, cast of thousands. And I think in this kind of race could could be helpful but his his problem too is he you know he can't get an early start i mean he has to sit back and wait um but uh but look you know he's also freed a little bit from from things i mean that's why he he, you know he's always been out there with his comments and said what he believes but now you know at his age he's been through it you know he gets this he's gonna do whatever the hell he wants to do which i like yeah i I think think there's a real appeal to that you know it's uh, so many people are so couched and so measured with their comments that you know when joe biden steps up in the right crowd right it's going to be gold. Interesting right. times we're living in. Even more interesting to have Peter Fenn to talk about it all. Uh, you can. Uh, we're having so much fun. You can join us. Eight six six fifty five Press. We'll be right back. This is the Bill Press Show. Stopbullying.gov. If you drive buzzed, it could cost you around $10,000. You'll face major legal fees, major fines, and steep insurance penalties. You could lose everything. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. When some people struggle with their mortgage payments, they become frozen, petrified. Not knowing what to do, they do nothing. But the people who take action are far more likely to get the most positive outcome. Making home affordable is a free government program. Call now to talk one-on-one with a housing expert about the options that are right for you. Real help, real answers, right now. Here at the GED Pep Talk Center, we have pep talkers standing by to get you motivated for your GED diploma. 
Text the name Terry to 69222 for a sympathetic pep talk. You show people what you really are. Or for a gentle pep talk, text the name Deborah. You know, you're going to make people very proud of you. And if that's not enough, text the name Danny for an extreme pep talk. Prove everyone wrong. Show them you're the boss. Get your GED pep talk and find free GED classes. Text the name of the person you want a pep talk from to 69222. Did you see the world differently? Did you celebrate the victory? So today, I state clearly and with conviction, America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. Did you stand up against our greatest threat? is the Bill Press Show. 26 minutes after the hour. Peter Fenn's with us, Democratic strategist. As a friend of Bill, and then Mary Kay Henry from the SEIU in the next segment, talk about the fast food strike. Peter, on the political front, one of the things, we just we talked last hour a little bit with Rebecca Cinderbrand about it. We have had two cases in the last week. In Kansas, Senate candidate, Democratic Senate candidate. In Alaska, Democratic gubernatorial candidate, where the Democrat has dropped out. Right basically endorsed the Republican, right. no, I'm sorry, the Independent, mm-hmm. as a way of beating Pat Roberts, the right. s- uh, incumbent senator in Kansas, and uh, the Republican candidate for governor the, in Alaska. The governor, this is yeah. a new trend. And you know, it, does it make it, sense it, to you? Oh, it, it totally does. First of all, more and more people are sort of fed up with with uh, with, with the uh, with, with politics as it is, <laughs> right? Uh, and 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 these candidates have wisely said, "Look, I, I can't win this race. The numbers aren't in my favor. We're splitting the vote, and I'm going to go with with the uh, uh, with, with my colleague here." And you know, there's a couple of points about this. First of all, y- you know, it suddenly takes a race. In Kansas, Senate race that was that was supposedly cooked and makes it a race. Secondly, you have in Kansas a Republican governor Brownback mm-hmm. who is in big big trouble. This is likely to help beat Brownback because people are fed up with this guy. Yeah, yeah. His policies have been a disaster, like Walker in Wisconsin and in in Alaska. It could help Mark Begich both in terms of turnout and enthusiasm. For, for that ticket. You know, the opposite story, and, and he's a friend of ours, but, you know, the independent candidate in Maine should get out. Yeah. Because, because yes. Michaud is, it got a, it will win this race right. without his uh, involvement. And he should have the, the uh, you know, intestinal fortitude and the integrity to leave that, that race. That, that, that's, that so independent that's candidate. Yeah. Up there, yeah. yeah. But if, if the, these independents in Kansas and uh, uh, um, Alaska, I think it's a great move. Okay, we'll talk fast food strike. When we come back, Peter Fenn and Mary Kay Henry. Is the Bill Press Show. 
Yes, so this is my computer. This is your computer. Let's go on the internet. Let's go. Click it. Yes. Okay. I cursor in between the R and the E. She's gonna love me all over again. That's it. Jamaica, here you go. Here we go. <laughs> Good right. job. Thank you. Thank you. And I did it by myself. Feel smarter. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. All right. I know this isn't any fun to talk about, but we should. Okay. So who's going to do what? I'll pack the dead batteries. Great. I'll only put what I don't need into a duffel bag. Perfect. That's totally unhelpful. No problem. Meanwhile, I will try to comfort everyone by speaking in a calm voice. And I'll try to get the generator going without any gas. Oh, let's not forget the cell phones, which probably won't work. Right. And who is going to handle supplies? I can forget to do a list for us. Thanks, pal. Well, I think we couldn't be any less prepared. I'm proud of you guys. Talk to your kids about who to call, where to meet, what to pack. Visit ready.gov slash kids for tips and information. Hey, thanks for stopping by. You know, I, I followed your character since the first episode. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Big, big fan. Thank you. And listen, your storyline, it makes for incredible TV drama. The thing is, your drug use is very adult content. Too adult for the kids. So I'm going to have to block you. Well, have a good one. You're a nice lady. On your radio, on TV, and online, this is The Bill Press Show. It is the Bill Press Show. We're coming to you live from Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, and our studio on Capitol Hill, brought to you today by the American Federation of Teachers, good men and women, teachers of America, uh, members of the AFT, under President Randy Weingarten, making a difference in our classrooms every day. You bet. In studio with us, political strategist uh, Peter Fenn. And Peter, I have to tell you, as a proud union member, 
I uh, the most impressive organizing campaign that I've seen on the part of our good brothers and sisters in the labor movement in years has been the, the efforts on behalf of fast food workers in this country. There have been uh, protests and strikes and, and, and events held in different cities around the, around the country over the last year or so. And today is a nationwide uh, fast food uh, protest, again, uh, just trying to get a decent living wage for uh, our fast food workers. And the driving force behind today's movement is the president of the Service Employees International Union, the SCIU, uh, a great labor leader, great American, Mary Kay Henry, who joins us on our news line from Oakland, California. Madam President, good morning. Thank you so much, Bill. I'm thrilled to be a part of the driving force, which is led by courageous fast food workers who've had the guts to keep striking and keep growing a movement that we believe has changed the conversation about what people should be able to earn uh, when they work hard for a living, and we're proud to support them. Absolutely. Uh, And then can you, let's let's start just by, because some people have the impression Fast food workers, these are just teenagers trying to get some extra pocket change, you know. I mean, tell us who the fast food worker population really is. Let's start there. Yeah, uh, 40% of the workers are over uh, 40. Uh, The average age is 28. Uh, 30% of the workers serving food to us in these restaurants are trying to support children. Hmm. About uh, 40% have college degrees. And so the fast food workforce is not a teenage workforce any longer. It is a workforce of people that are trying to earn a living, pay the rent and electric bill, and maybe get some classes in. But Mm -hmm. because of the poverty wages they're paid, it's not Uh, possible. And that's why these workers have joined together and are insisting on $15 in a union. Yeah, that's it. And these are so many of them. You know, trying to support their families, support their kids, make a living, and yet forced to live in poverty at 725, yes. right, a full-time job, they're still living yes. in below the poverty level. Right. When their co- corporations that own them are making record profits, and we know that in other countries around the world, these same corporations that operate in our country are paying living wages. In Australia, it's $19 an hour. In Denmark, it's $22 an hour. So... If it can be done for workers in other parts of the world, we believe it can be accomplished here for U.S. fast food workers. Amen. And is uh, Mary, this is Peter Fenn, by the way, a proud SEIU member, adjunct professor at George Washington All right. University, Great. one of the first right, places Peter. first places that you uh, you organized uh, adjuncts, and I was a supporter of that. And uh, well, I guess I'm not. Peter, it's the courage of leaders like you at universities all across this country that are sticking their necks out and joining together, and we're proud to support your leadership well, thank, in making it happen. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and my question, too, is, uh, is this, that people kind of forget that fast w- food workers do not get tips. I mean, there aren't even uh, uh, ways for, for, for the uh, customers to leave money for, for these people. So their salary is their salary, whereas in a lot of restaurants and in, in and overseas, there are service charges that mm-hmm. go into this, but but uh, you, you know you 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 really are stuck at that uh, at that minimum wage level uh, in, right. a, in a fast food restaurant. And in addition to that, Peter, eighty percent of the workers' wages are stolen by practices like having to clock out and continue to clean a store. Oh. The workers are giving one or two hours of volunteer time when they ought mm-hmm. to be paid for it. Uh, schedules are changed so that people aren't paid overtime. Um, there's no benefits to benefits. speak of, no paid time off. Most oh. workers in this sector are using either food stamps or Medicaid to make ends meet. And that's why we think this movement to join together and get 15 in a union will transform not just these workers' lives, but the lives of the community that they live in and hold corporations accountable to investing in their workforce again so we can get the economy growing from the people that do the work um, and throughout the service sector. Mary Kay Henry, president of the SEIU, here on our news line from Oakland, California, about today's fast food protest. Tell us what's planned for today and in how many cities and what kind of actions, Mary Kay. Well, what I understand from the East Coast, uh, it, Bill, is that 
uh, workers in Times Square were arrested for their peaceful, nonviolent civil oh, disobedience God. earlier today in blocking 42nd Street. Um, Houston is now on strike. In Tampa, they've had a walkout. I know in Detroit, there were arrests for civil disobedience. And so um, your listeners can follow what's happening by going to strikefastfood.org. There's pictures being posted um, in each of the cities as they go. We're proud that the West Coast is going to come online here (laughs) as uh, dawn breaks at 6 a.m. in Oakland and Sacramento. I was part of the Fast Food Workers Convention a month ago in Chicago where 1,300 workers had a really serious discussion about whether it was time to take this movement to the next level Mm -hmm. and draw on the lessons of their civil rights ancestors to make it crystal clear that they're never going to give up or give in until they win 15 in a union. And so that's why they voted uh, to begin to take a rest today, which is not an easy thing in communities where everybody's raised by their grandmothers, mothers, and fathers to say, don't you ever get in trouble with the police and don't you mm-hmm. take an arrest. Right. So today has extra special meaning for the fast food workers movement. So this is really uh, uh, an important next step, if you will, in, in this movement. And uh, and again, we're talking about peaceful, nonviolent, just sit, sit-ins uh, civil disobedience for which they're getting arrested. Make that clear. That's right. And yes. there's two other dimensions today, Bill. There's workers being supportive around the globe. We just saw a picture posted from Belgium um, mm. who are supporting uh, workers here in the U.S. And home care workers across the country are joining the fight for 15 yes. today. In Atlanta, they joined. They're going to be joining here in Oakland and Sacramento and cities all across the U.S. because they understand that $15 and a union is a basic demand um, that we need to win so that we can change the economy for everybody. Yeah, that, and that, that's it, real important. And by the way, that whole issue, we'll have to get you back uh, pretty soon, Mary Kay, talk about the home care health right. workers, too. That's a very, very important constituency. Well, SEIO yeah. has been amazing uh, uh, organizing uh, those folks. Yeah, California. absolutely. When Peter, Andy Stern. Yeah, I, 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 one of the things I was going to ask about was, you know, Mitch McConnell's statements to the Koch brothers convention uh, uh, to a lot oh, of us God. were absolutely unbelievable. I um, mean, here's a guy who absolutely shows nothing but contempt for minimum wage workers. And, yeah. you know, I think, isn't it time that we took it to some of these politicians who uh, who, who really, uh, you know, are, 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 I hate to put it this way, and, and I know you wouldn't, uh, uh, Madam President, but are putting their middle finger up to, uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the, like, to the, to the middle class workers and to the yeah. fast food workers. Well, that's why we think a movement that has been growing um, since November of 2012, when the brave 200 New York workers first started this movement, and then it grew to nine cities, and then 60 cities, and then 200 cities, and then it went global this past May, that it shows that um, Mitch McConnell and his ilk can say whatever he wants, but no right-wing politician, no state legislature, no governor, no Supreme Court is going to stand in the way of working people joining together and figuring out how to prove, uh, improve their lives. Because we believe time's up on trickle-down, and it's mm-hmm. time for us to raise wages again all across this economy because yeah. we all deserve better. Yeah, Ms. McGonnell says, yeah, we're not going to waste our time on yeah. goofy things like mm-hmm. raising minimum mm-hmm. wage. Oh, my God. What a, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Allison Grimes, go, go, go. go, go, go. Uh, finally, <laughs> I have to ask you, um, Mary Kay, is, so is the effort, is the focus here to get from 15 and a union from the cities, from the states, or from the, the federal government? I mean, what is, what is the focus here? Our focus for the fast food worker movement is to um, achieve a national settlement with the mm-hmm. multinational corporations that sell burgers in the U.S. So it would be the workers' vision to have McDonald's, right. Wendy's, Burger King come to That's a national good. bargaining table and achieve a national settlement. For the home care workers, it's going to be a combination of what you just described, which Mm -hmm. is the federal government, the state government, and private agencies 
uh, coming together with home care workers and establishing $15 an hour as a standard because we know when home care workers achieve that, they're going to be able to provide better care to the seniors and disabled that they care deeply about and be able to have a solid uh, job that they can count on being able to provide for their families and for the people they serve right. every day. And, you know, uh, not everybody, of course, you've got a lot of support here, but not everybody supports what you're doing today. The National Restaurant Association. Are you kidding me? They <laughs> are out there. That's right. They're out there with a statement saying, all you're trying to do, Mary Kay Henry, is come up and try to support your dwindling membership or report your... Yep. That's all the labor unions are up to today. Almost laugh out loud funny, but... What What's your response to them? Well, your um, spirit is part of my response. We consider it ridiculous. (laughs) This is the same fast. This association and the corporations are uh, make this ridiculous claim, and also then advise workers that they should sing uh, in order to relieve their stress. (laughs) They ought to get another job if they Uh, want to make ends meet, and they ought to take a paid vacation, which they can't afford, in order to reduce heart attacks. So it, for me, that claim by the Restaurant Association is as ridiculous as the industry's claim about how workers should try and live in poverty while trying to stitch together two and three jobs. And we're done with it. We're um, proud to support this growing movement of fast food workers that are now being joined today by home care workers and insisting that we all can do better when we raise wages and create good jobs in our community. Uh, it's great that what you're doing, and that's great that you're out there. I, uh, I, I, I wish I could join you in Oakland and Sacramento today, but it's uh, dawn's just about, sun's just about coming up out there, so we better <laughs> let you right. go so you can get that's out on right. the line. Mary Kay Henry, Thank President so of SEIU. Thank you so much, Mary Kay. See you soon. Okay. She's the greatest. She, yeah, was you know, good stuff. Yeah. Good stuff. They're gonna. They're really making a difference, too. This thing has been so well organized and so focused. Well, and the important thing, too, uh, uh, on this, Bill, is it's growing. I yes. mean, you, you know, this isn't just a few isolated places. Nope, you're this, right. this, this, and and these, the other one thing we didn't say, these workers are putting their lives on the line by by going out there because yeah. they're likely to, it's easy for them to get fired. I love the slogan, can't survive on 725. Five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hard to argue with that. We'll be right back. This is the Bill Press Show. What gets you into college? Good SAT scores? High GPA? Lots of extracurriculars? Sure, but what you really need is money. If you don't have the cash, you'll need a loan. And we mean huge student loans because the cost of college has risen 1,000% in the last 30 years. This means big money for the banks that collect fees and interest. Now, millions of young people are starting their adult lives with an average of $29,000 of loans on their backs. Altogether, we're talking $1.2 trillion in student debt. And more and more people are finding it impossible to pay them back. Welcome to the student debt crisis. The increasing demand for higher education and cuts to state funding gave colleges a huge incentive to keep inflating prices. I graduated about a year ago, currently in $35,000 of debt. I am in debt about like $25,000. I owe $23,000. I owe over $50,000 in student loans. 38.8 million Americans owe money on a student loan. And the biggest names in banking are making huge profits off the booming student loan industry. Sally May, the largest provider of private student loans, made $949 million last year. They only give you about six months to look for a job. You have to start paying like that back the loan. Like it's, it's very pressuring, especially nowadays. It's very hard to find a job. Over half of the students graduating in 2012 could not find a decent paying job. They either had low-wage jobs or unpaid internships or were unemployed altogether. So you can't make the payments. You start incurring late fees, which makes the loan even harder to pay off. And it stays with you for years, even decades. Right now, a third of the people who started repaying their loans are delinquent or in default. That's 13.7 million people, more than the populations of Chicago, New York, and San Francisco combined. Worse, it's not just the borrowers who are in trouble. Many loans require co-signers. So if the student is unable to pay, that co-signer, a father, a mother, or a grandparent, is now on the hook. 
Even a grandparent's social security benefits can be garnished to pay the loan. We should have an answer to this. If you get really behind in your car payment or your credit cards, you can file for bankruptcy. But Congress has made it nearly impossible to discharge student loans through bankruptcy. Big institutions make big profits while students try to make ends meet under crushing debt. Is this how we want our education system to work? The whole point of going to college is to get the career you want, but I've, lately that's been discouraged because no one can afford school. You get a job just to pay off your student loans. We need higher education, not higher debt. Sign up to end the student debt crisis at higherednotdebt.org. your radio, on TV, and online. This is The Bill Press Show. Uh, 11 minutes uh, before the top of the hour, Thursday, September 4, we are here with uh, Brother Peter Fenny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've been called worse. Fen, Fen. <laughs> yeah, really. but I didn't know, realize you're my union brother here. This is yeah, great. This is, yeah, it's a real. union okay. shop. Right. Right. It is That's a union right. shop. We are a union shop, indeed. Uh, Peter Fenn, Democratic strategist. So, um, Peter, what is, you know, there are a lot of Democrats who are kind of glum, and the prevailing media uh, the story is that this is a bad year for Democrats, a great year for Republicans, right. and a lot of Republicans are feeling kind of maybe overconfident. I think. How, do you, how do you sense the mood? Well, a couple things that are happening, I think, Bill. First of all, um, when you look at those overall numbers, right track, wrong track numbers, the yeah, president's yeah. popularity, uh, the way people are feeling about their own lives and the state of the economy, even the, the economy is improving. You, you know, as a Democrat, you get very nervous. Um, but the other side of the argument is they don't like the Republicans either. In fact, they <laughs> like the Republicans less than they like the Democrats. Secondly, these are very independent independent kinds of races out there. Sure, we have more seats to protect. But Larry Sabato points out that, you know, you know, other than a couple of times, it's not so easy to defeat in, in incumbent Democrats. The, the, the thing that everybody talks about, is there going to be a wave? Is, there, is this going to coalesce? But so that, 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 that's a real question. The where third is, point. Where is the wave? Well, that, you know, I, that, I don't know. The waves sometimes, as you and I know, they can, they can happen it kind can of happen right at towards the, at the end. Right, at the towards the end. Yeah, but we haven't but, but we, we haven't seen, seen it, it yet, right? No, we haven't seen it, and and it hasn't been directed at one party. That's for darn sure. It's directed, you know, it's pox on all your all your houses. Um, the final thing that I would say on this is that a lot of these races, if they remain very very close, we're talking North Carolina, we're talking Colorado, we're talking about uh, uh, Alaska, we we uh, you know we're we're talking about Arkansas, um, Iowa. You know, if these things stay very very close, the get out the vote ground game mm. is critical. Mm. And even though the enthusiasm level is a little higher on the Republicans, the Democrats have their act together, especially in these states where 2008, 2012, the, the Obama, Obama, we know where the, they live. The Obama machine, right. yeah. And, they, and, and, and my advice to Democratic campaigns now is put your money and your effort and your time and your energy into identifying your vote and getting them out, because there's your 1%, 2%, difference. It's not a 5% difference, but it's a couple percent difference, and it could lead to us winning some of these very close races. So turnout, turnout, turnout. Turnout, turnout, turnout. Uh, as opposed to the theory that you just dump all your money on television? Look, I'm a TV guy. I've been for 25 years. It's pay more, get less. People are not paying attention. they has been flooded with these ads for six months now. You know, can you break through at some points? Yeah, I guess. But it's really, really hard. So, you know, I'm into so voter that, ID and that, get out the is that, would you say Is that this kind of the soft underbelly of the Koch brothers operation? Uh, which is all about money. That's all yeah, they. Yeah, I mean they. They put, don't have a ground game. Well, they do say they? they do. They say they're putting 125 million dollars or something in the ground games. I haven't seen it. I don't know where it is, but. Um, 
you know, I think everybody's so afraid to get off of the traditional TV ad buys, that, and they're scared to do it. You know, it's better to go to shows like this. It's better to go to, to, to put 15-second pre-rolls targeted to, to the photos you're trying to get to on their computers. It's better to go to their, to their uh, iPhones with ads and, and, and their Twitter accounts and Twitter feeds. You know, right now, the, 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 the hmm. whole communications revolution is changing politics big time. Wow. In my view. Wow. No, that's interesting. That's yeah. really interesting stuff, yeah. Can you say that again about uh, people ought to spend money <laughs> yeah, on the, that's right. on no, the Bill Press show? Yeah, I mean, if you're, if, you you're, <laughs> if you're a Democrat, you better make sure that, that, that the, the folks who are listening to this show are going to turn out to vote. You got to know who they are. You know, you got you to advertise on there. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Brother Peter Fenn. That's right, right. I knew we liked him for some reason. I got my evangelical uh, yeah, voice on today. <laughs> All right. All right. You make us feel better. You make yeah, us you yeah. filled us full of hope. I hope so. All right. Thanks, Peter. Thanks so much <laughs> Thanks, for coming great, in. Great, great my turn. Here. Peter Parting Shot coming up next. This is the Bill Press Show. It is possible to read the history of this country as one long struggle to extend the liberties established in our Constitution to everyone in America. In other words, who, according to our laws and culture, gets to be considered a person? The law creates legal personhood, and movements create law and change culture. So, how have the courts passed laws to shape our culture? That history goes way back before Citizens United. 1819, Dartmouth College versus Woodward, Supreme Court case, turned a corporate charter from a government-granted charter to a contract. This ruling gave corporations standing within the Constitution. 1886, Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad. Though the court did not rule on corporate personhood, the decision was subsequently cited as a precedent to hold that a private corporation is entitled to the same 14th Amendment rights of due process and equal protection as human beings. This makes it impossible for us to make laws that treat local businesses any differently than giant multinational corporations, even if their business practices are deemed to be harmful to workers, the environment and communities, or if they have a history of violating the law. Hale versus Henkel, 1906. The court granted corporations the Fourth Amendment search and seizure protection. Dodge versus Ford Motor Company, 1919. The Michigan Supreme Court says, the business corporation is organized and carried on primarily for the profit of the stockholders. Stockholder primacy is established. The purpose of the corporation, according to the court, is no longer to serve the public good, as it had been. It is now to maximize profit for shareholders above all else. Pennsylvania Coal Company versus Mahon, 1922. Corporations get the Fifth Amendment takings clause, meaning if you pass a regulation that impacts a corporation's ability to make a profit, that is deemed a taking, and they can sue for the right to future profits lost. This creates a chilling effect, and local and state governments become much more hesitant to pass laws in the public interest for fear that corporations can claim loss of potential profits that cities and states will be on the hook to pay. Buckley v. Vallejo, 1976. The Supreme Court rules that spending money to influence elections is protected under the First Amendment, in effect saying that money is speech. Citizens United v. Federal Election Commission, 2010. Today, the Supreme Court of Chief Justice John Roberts declared that because of the alchemy of its 19th century predecessors in deciding that corporations had all the rights of people any restrictions on how these corporate beings spend their money on political advertising are unconstitutional. The court's ruling threatens to undermine the integrity of elected institutions across the nation. It's a rejection of the common sense of the American people. The Parting Shot with Bill Press. This is The Bill Press Show. Well, as we remember, uh, Eric Kanner stunned the political world uh, earlier this year by losing his house seat to an unknown challenger, David Bratt. Bratt beat Kanner by accusing him of caring more about Wall Street than the people of his own district. And it turns out that Bratt was right. 
because Cantor just got a new job, and guess who hired him? A big Wall Street firm. Yeah, he got a good deal, too. Got a signing bonus of $1.5 bucks, starting salary of $2 million a year, even though he has zero experience in high finance or banking or the market. Not bad for a guy who was only pulling down $175,000 as a member of Congress. But, you know, this job of Eric Cantor is nothing but a legal form of bribery. He's now being rewarded for years of doing what's right for Wall Street and what's not right for Main Street. In other words, he's still doing the same job working for Wall Street. He's just getting paid more for it. See you tomorrow morning. Have a good one. This is the Bill Press Show.